The only thing I never done was kidnapping. Because I never used to see the point. Just fucking shoot them, innit? What are you kidnapping them for? Send a message. My dad, yeah, yeah. used to hold me, right? And, and punch me in my face. Like, punch me in my face. Like, kick me. Hit me with things. Like, like, like he burnt my hand over the f fire, like, because I nicked a star bar on a pack of Wrigley Spearmint gum. Burnt my hand over the fire. And made me eat, you know, a cone of hot pepper sauce. Yeah. Like, like a spoonful of that. I had to eat two spoonfuls of that after I had my hand burned over the fire and then I put in a cold bath and then beat him with a belt. <laughs> I don't know how he used to do it. Like having kids myself, yeah? I just don't know how he used to do it. And now I've gone to the and he's come trying to kill me. And as I've opened my eye, he went bang. And the last one, look. Fucking hell, man. Yeah. Come straight up, went straight in there. So I picked up a big bane here. And I've run down the stairs believing that my three or four pals were behind me. And I've run into the kitchen, through the kitchen door, I put the fucking paint up to his front. I said, touch my mum again, you cunt, I'll kill ya. What do you mean breaking your legs, breaking your legs? Sam! Sam! Go on. How? How can you think it's okay to stab somebody, yeah? 12 or 15 times for chatting to your bird. How's it okay to shoot somebody because they don't pay you no money? Do you know what I mean? How's it okay to boot someone's door off and weigh them in in front of their family because they've let you down? Like, do you understand? Like, it's just what we accept as normal behavior is barbaric insanity. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Marvin Herbert. How are you, brother? Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. You've led a very interesting life. You've um, got over 70 convictions. You've been shot five times. You've been stabbed. You've been in prisons. You've ran about with the biggest names, not just in Europe, but worldwide. You've, you know the, the elite, but you're trying to change your life. Well, you are a changed man now, but first of all, it's good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. How have you been? Um, you know what? Um, it's been a blessing being free, you know? So when people ask me how I've been, it's, it, it, it's amazing. Like actually being free from the restraints of the life choices I made prior to my transition, you know? Yeah. You've run about, like I said earlier, with the the elite of the criminal underworld. But before we get into all that, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Well, it started in Liverpool. I was born in um, Fazakli Hospital, 1972. My dad was a Bayesian. Um, my mum was from Croxteth. Um, very sort of conflictuous relationship from the off. Croxteth being one of the most racist parts of Liverpool at the time. Um, and Irish and Scottish parents, my mum and my dad being Bayesian, full Bayesian, I suppose. The, the, the twang of his accent, the, the swagger of his body, his clothes, because he was like a, an old player into the transport game as a young man himself. He used to do a lot of the, uh, the sense of meaning you importations um, for a while, you know. So my dad was in the world. My mum was is one of many women because I've got brothers just and I think about 15, 16 of us all together, brothers and sisters from all different mums all around Europe and the rest of the world. Um, so my dad was pretty active out there, bit of a playboy. Um, earliest memories I had of Liverpool was Mount Pleasant School. And you know what, I want to put this out there because I've always wondered, because I've got one memory of a, the last fight I ever had. And as mad as it sounds, it's always bugged me. And I don't know why. I had a fight with a guy called Christopher Hatton in the ball ring in, it might have been 1975 or, no, 1978 or 1979, it could have been, yeah. Um, it was my last fight. I remember the fight it was over a girl in the ball ring and we had a fight in the bin sheds. A little ginger-haired kid he was. And I've always, 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 I don't know why, it's always been in the back of my mind. I wonder how he is, I wonder how he's developed, I wonder how he's turned out. And, uh, yeah, Chris Fatton, that was my f the, the first memory. 
Um, we lived across the road from the new cathedral in Liverpool. So it was a bit of a building site growing up. So we was over there playing all the time, doing all the camps, chase, getting chased by the tramps. Fishy was the resident um, sort of down and out of the area. That was in, we used to call him Fishy, big beard fella. Um, he used to chase us off. We used to do bits and pieces like normal, naughty, naughty kids do, making camps and stuff. Um, and then the first bit of trauma, because I relay everything in my life. It's, um, it's ironic. It's all connected. It's all connected to yeah. the trauma, right? So the first bit of trauma was um, the Christopher Atom fight. I don't know why that's been such an impact in my life, but it has and it always will be. Um, and then getting run over. I got run over on Brownlow Hill. Well, no, not Brownlow Hill. I was around the corner from on Pleasant Street. We used to go to a Sunday school. How old were you? Um, maybe five or six. Yeah, because I was seven when we come to London. So it might have been four or five even. Mm -hmm. And basically, we used to go to Sunday school. And basically, I'd I'd done so well that it was giving out all the Christmas presents to everyone, right? And I'd done so well that they'd saved my present till last. This is what I've late found out later. So they'd, they'd hold in my presents will last, but they've got all the presents out. So I thought instantly, they haven't got a present for me. So obviously I've got the, um, I can't remember the mindset I had back then, but I knew I was angry because I run, rejected. Yeah, I run out of there crying, run across the road, boom, I got hit by a, a red, um, what are they, TR7s. Do you remember the TR7s, yeah. right? So um, I got hit up in the air and I remember looking and I see the people at the top of the bus and then I've hit the floor. I ended up going to all day hospital. Um, I had my legs in track, my right leg, the same leg that's um, got fractured when I got shot. Um, that got broken. I got, um, I had a, it wasn't a pin, but it was like a traction weight on my leg to keep my leg separated. I was in there for a few months and then we got out of there. I was, got better. Um, and then, hold on. Another bit of trauma, I fell over on a, a milk bottle and it went right through my leg. So I got a big scar on my leg there. That was in Kirby. And then I got run over. Yeah, because the, remember the must just come back there was actually getting held down by the doctor when they were trying to give me the injection in the cut. But that wasn't getting run over, that was the bottle. So I've just done things out of chronological order there. So I got fell on a bottle first and then I got run over. After I got run over, we got better, and it was sort of a bit of a blur from then until we moved to London. So I don't really remember much. So it must have been happy days, everything fine, you know, like you live in life, everything, there's no issues, no trauma. So there was nothing significant for me to remember. And then I remember the day we was moving to London. It was like, we're moving to London. And it was like, what? We're moving to London, and we're going to London. So. We were going to London, and I remember going to London. I remember we moved from Brownlow Hill, which is the the top of town, Bullring, um, to Chalk Hill Estate in Wembley, in West London. So that was the first experience of Londoners. So obviously, speaking like a scarcer, um, I was alien to the environment, being mixed race in the predominantly racist. England at that time being mixed race never went well because I, I couldn't mix with the blacks or the whites properly because I was always frowned upon by the blacks and the whites you know so trying to fit in was always a challenge and basically I found a lot of comfort in sort of violence from like, a young age yeah that's what got me noticed that's what got me accepted that's what got me liked that's what got me sweets drinks chicken footballs like fags you know like you're my mate you're my mate and I, like so if anyone had a problem marv marv and then i'd fight or i'd do whatever it was you know like whatever was necessary from that early age um i'd fight in little people's battles or fighting the older kids for the younger kids like even fighting some of the younger kids' older brothers because I didn't like the way they treated them sort of thing. So I didn't understand why I was different. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't understand why his mum didn't like me or his dad didn't like me, him being black. My dad's black, my mum's white. Why don't people like me? Like, I couldn't... It never resonated when I was a kid. So the release for that was... 
always trying to please other people to get accepted. And that's when it started manifesting. Was that like a sense of bullying then, like mental torture, that people wouldn't accept you for your skin colour, for being from Liverpool? You're at, do you know what I mean? Was that a sense? It's, just, it's the same with anything, isn't it? It's just unfamiliarity breeds contempt, yeah. I believe. Like, it's... It's just part and parcel with the, the human programming system yeah. that we're all accustomed to, no matter who you are, what, no matter where you come from, right? And this is one thing I'm starting to realise with my development in a transition, right? Everyone's born with or programmed into some form of racism, no matter whether you're white, black, Chinese, Muslim, you don't like somebody. Your your cultures don't like another culture. There's just It's just an, an inherited sort of patheticness because I just believe racism, because of the due diligence I've done over the last few years, yeah, in genetics, in humans, and where we come from, where we started from, how we existed, I actually realised that the spectrum of a human being that a lot of people don't realise is every bloodline is black and white. So if you, every bloodline goes back seven grandfathers, well, and I say this quite a lot, and people I would implore them to go and investigate, seven grandfathers, you'll see a black man you'll see a black man, mm -hmm. guaranteed, right? within the seven grandfathers, usually two, three or fourth. So your grandfather, his grandfather, his grandfather, they'll be black, guaranteed. And if you're black, they'll be white. And that is something that I've started to realise is very common, but we're programmed not to see it or believe it. So because of that ignorance growing up and trying to fit in with everybody, now I sort of understand the, the racism isn't specific to white people or black people. Racism is something that is just programmed into every sort of race on the planet. And it's just learning to deal with it as an early kid growing up. It was just ag. So How, how old did your dad stick around for? Was he there? He was there. My dad was around because... I used to believe that my dad didn't love me. I used to believe my dad never cared about me because of information I received from my mum. But it wasn't until my dad died that I realised he did love me and he really had my best interest at heart. You know, like, him and my mum had a lot of conflict. My mum was a bit of a party girl. My dad was a bit of a bully, drug dealer, violent member who was very controlling. So... If my dad would leave my mum on her own for two, three weeks and turn up, my mum would be chatting to a geezer, my dad would weigh her in. So it was very confusing growing up looking at my mum and dad's relationship. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So... That can was, play a major factor in your life as well. well he, 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 my dad played a massive part in my life because, for example, um, moving from moving on a bit to I was about... 13, between 12 and 14. So I started smoking puff around 10, 11. And basically I realised that all the stuff that my dad used to get delivered is what everybody wanted. So when my dad used to get all these crates of puff and weed, I used to nick carrier bags of it and stuff, right? So I learned, apart from the violence how to manipulate and work with people with the puff. So I used to nick a lot of puff off my dad. So 12 to 14, I was nicking a lot of puff from my dad. And that's when I got to 14 is when my dad sort of exited because I was nicking puff off my dad for so long, right? And then basically my mum used to get all the beatings because my dad used to believe my mum was nicking his grub. But it wasn't my mum, it was me. And then basically what happened one day I'm in my bedroom. We've nicked um, a parcel of, I think it was jeans. It might have jeans. We used to do the jump ups on the vans, right? So we've nicked a parcel of 501 jeans um, between four of us and we've got a couple of hundred pairs of jeans. Or, or I can't remember exactly how much jeans we had or how much product we had, but we were in my bedroom and we're sorting out the piles of club of what we're going to sell, who we're going to sell it to. And I've heard my dad downstairs because my dad used to leave all his puff in my mum's house, come around carnival because my dad was a big player in the Sensimania world. And since he died, 
the black sentimania, what they used to get, they don't really get it so frequently. And people know my dad, Bajan Barry, from all over Harlesden, Stonebridge, Brixton, um, Labrook Grove, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham. Like he's, he's well known because he travelled the country doing what he was doing. And basically, I'm in the bedroom with my mates and I've heard my dad having a go at my mum, believing that she's nicked his grub. But because all my mates profit from me nicking the grub, I'm like, bruv, bruv, what? And they're like, Marv, is your dad in there? I was like, I don't fucking care, man. Come on, we got to do him, innit? And they're like, Marv, man, like, cause my dad was six foot four, like, he was like all the Mr. T chains, all the, like, he had all the gold watches, he had a, a Rover 35S back in the day, he had a Jag back, like, he had the Garms, he had the club, he had the diamonds, he had everything. Do you know what I mean? As a kid looking up to him, he was like, A hero? Um, yeah. So, like, because he was the man on the street at that time, my mates didn't want to confront him. So I was like, nah, come on, come on, please, please. Like, oh, it's my mum, it's my mum, it's my mum. And it was like, fuck it, coming in. So I picked up a big bainy and I've run down the stairs believing that my three or four pals were behind me. And I've run into the kitchen, boot the kitchen door, I put the fucking bain out to his front. I said, touch my mum again, you cunt, I'll kill you. And he's just gone, ooh. I said, move, move. And I pushed it in his neck a little bit. And when I see him move, it gave me a bit of confidence. I said, get out of my house, you fucking cunt. You ever put your hands on my mum again, I'll kill you, stone dead now, get out. And he's backed up, backed up. I said, yeah? Yeah? I said, don't fucking come back here leaving your gear here. And it ain't my mum that's been taking your gear. I've been taking your fucking gear for years, your mug. Now get out of my house. And he sort of backed up and left. So when he's left, I'm like, mum, don't ever let him in the house again. This is going to happen, that's going to happen. And then I sort of went one step further with that. I've got, it was only a replica, but I had a replica 44. And my dad used to have a, we used to work and do bits and pieces in Church Road over Stonebridge Way, um, Wilsdon. And they used to do gambling houses in the snooker club and stuff like that. And he was up there. So I thought, I've got to go and put it on him again, let him know he can't come back to my house. But I'm going to do it in front of his friends because I know how much he used to love How being old were you? 14. Still on that young boy. Yeah, 14 I was. And um, I thought, fuck it. So I've got the thing, gone up me about. I said, come and drive me over there, drive me over there. So when I've walked in the downstairs bit, I put the gun down the back of my trousers, but I left it so when you looked up at me, you see it. Do you know what I mean? I left it so everyone could see. When I walked in, if they looked, who's that? They could see it. So when I walked in, I walked in, and they were all sitting down playing cards, and I just walked in, I just went, shh, 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 shh. you ever fucking come down my ass again, you fucking mug, I'll blow your head off. I'm telling you, don't ever go to my mum's ass ever again. And then a couple of his mates, oh, Barry, Barry. So I've switched on them. I said, say another fucking word. Say another fucking word. And they all just sort of welled up a little bit, which fueled my ego a little bit, made me really lose my mind a little bit. That gave you a power trip. Yeah, to really realise did. Yeah, that yeah. People have feared me, but they'll respect me now. Yeah, and it was like, these are the biggest people in my world. Like my dad, innit? Like, <sighs> like, uh, I love my dad. Like, I always loved my dad, but I always defended my mum. Do you understand? So I always secretly wanted to be my dad. When I'd go out with my dad, would turn up in places and he'd be the, the life and soul of the party. Like everybody wanted to speak to my dad. He was the man. So that's what I wanted to be. So Although we had conflict over that with my mum, I always had a relationship with him and I'd always go and see him. He had other kids that I'd always go and see me, little brother, Kirk and Leomi. I'd go and spend time with them. And so I never hated my dad personally. I hated my dad because of what I believed. <sighs> what I believed my mum said about him, you know, and it weren't until the funeral that I realised the impact that and I've got to say it because we had a, a few, we had a funeral on um, Ferdinand Ferd, Ferdinand Road in um, Kilburn, and it was roadblocked. Like you couldn't get anybody in there. The, the church was ramo. The people outside it was ramo. Like there was two, three thousand people there, and I was like, "What the fuck?" I had to write naughty speech to get up and cope my dad about leaving my family with things, and then oh, old age pensioners. <sighs> Old age pensioners were coming up to me saying, oh, your dad, you was your dad's favourite. Your dad loved you. Your dad this, your dad that, your dad this. And I was like, wow. 
And it was just like, I had to look at my mum and say, how could you say my dad never loved me? And then obviously because I've had girlfriends and I've been in relationships, I haven't give some of my partners money for a reason. Do you understand? So then I started putting a correlation to why my dad would leave my mum without money. And it wasn't because my mum was an angel. Do you understand? So the programming I had growing up, which fueled 90% of my anger, was because of the way my dad treated my mum and us included, right? But at the funeral, because of everyone come up to me, it made me realise that I'd wasted the opportunities to get to know my dad or speak to my dad, or even ask him what happened when we were kids growing up. Why did you treat my mum like this? I always just believed my mum never questioned it. But whenever my mum come up, my dad would say, I don't want to talk about your mum. I don't want to talk about your mum. Do you understand? So... She was battling with her own problems. Yeah. Yeah. And painting my dad out to be the bad guy when mm. it was about when we were skint. Like, we'd only have money when my dad was about. Do you know what I mean? Like, my mum went to work and she tried her hardest, but looking after fucking four kids, four mixed, well, three mixed race kids and one white kid in an environment that's just no blacks, no dogs and no Irish. Like, it's hard for a white woman, especially mm. being from Liverpool. So I sort of empathise with what my mum had to go through. And I understand the programming that she had that led to the behaviour that I was accustomed to and I had to deal with, you know, but it's, it always falls back to that programming aspect of society and how you're meant to believe and how you're meant to think and how you're meant to behave, right? So my mum, my mum was my best mate. She still is, but she done what she felt was appropriate for her to feed her kids yeah some people say but that's it, that's it, life yeah and the, what your mum's been through is all she knew as well the, yeah. how she's been raised same as your dad same as you same as your your, your kids are a reflection of you do yeah. you know what i mean and it's all they know it's not that they're bad people <laughs> do you know what i mean it's um yeah that's why i'm glad my kids are in a good place boy. <laughs> 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 oh, no it's true like but I say, show me a man, show me his kid, show me a man, show me his home, right? Mm -hmm. So growing up, I don't, I don't blame anything or anybody for what I went through because I made choices to become somebody. And what I wanted to become was the biggest, baddest, most frightening villain there was. Like, and my inspiration come from the Sweeney, Police Five, you know, all that sort of yeah. budget. Oh, that's going to be me. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So... From a very, very early age, I was programming myself not to become another version of my dad because he never looked after us. We was always skinny. He looks good, but we're not good. So I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm going to be like them geese who've got the, the, the big cars and the big, uh, the proper gangsters that are shooting people. Like my dad, they're all gambling. They smoke weed. Like they're hanging about. And, like, so the correlation between success for me wasn't my dad selling weed in the back gambling asses it was the gangsters in the nightclubs and in the bars buying drinks for everybody do you know what I mean champagne lifestyle yeah cup of, mm -hmm. coming up suntanned and all that like taking their kids on holiday like I had it with a lot of growing up as a kid a lot of the armed robbers from Kentish Town and Islington were my mate's dads so I was grown up with all these old armed robbers right? I won't mention no one's names but everyone knows my mates and knows their parents so I was brought up with the armed robbery mindset of never rat on your friends, take it to the grave. You know what I mean? Don't tell lies and be game. Don't back down from no one and get your own dough. So the principles that we was programmed into believing to move forward was programmed into me from a very early age. And because I didn't want to become a version of my dad, I chose to become an armed robber. So I chose to go up the ladder to become an armed robber. And it started from nicking car stereos. And I can talk about it. Right, so my car stereos days is what sort of connected me to other villains throughout later in life. And it was just sort of spawned a lot of criminal activities because it's mad how things happen. So I'll tell you the story. I used to nick car stereos 
and then basically from the car stereos, people wanted car parts, and then like, and then whole cars. So it became there was a little group of us from Camden and Belsize Park, and we used to collate together, about seven or eight of us, all from different backgrounds. Some was white, some was Spanish, some was African, some was Jamaican, another was two others was mixed race, and the rest were white, and basically. We used to go out nicking car stereos. At that time, we used to get £100 per stereo, £150 for Black Punk New York or Pioneer 9010 or 9086, something like that. And basically, we used to get money. And then basically, we used to, if you go out and nick five, six stereos, five, six hundred pounds, 12, 13 years of age, it's a lot of money. And then how that used to grow was we used to play blackjack and then win car stereos. So from a very early age, we was becoming accustomed to having a lot of money. And then basically... One day, someone said to me, can you get upcaps? So I was like, upcaps? What, for cars? He was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, of course I can. He was like, well, I'll pay for the upcaps. I was like, how much? It was how, like, it went from five pound up to 75 pound per hubcap. And I was like, are you joking? He was like, no. I said, yeah, I'll get you them. So it started off with, I don't know why, but MG Metros, right? <laughs> JB, right? That's his initials, right? from over um, Abbey Road. I don't mention it because these were the players back in the day when I was a kid growing up driving at MG Metro's fully loaded, you know, like, <laughs> and they wanted hubcaps. Yeah, so then, yeah. They wanted all wanted, mm -hmm. so then the hubcaps, then the BM hubcaps, and then the Rolls Royce hubcaps used to get 75 quid each for them, right? So basically when we used to nick the car stereo, I was used to find the keys in the glove compartment. So then obviously we used to nick the, the, the minis with the window wipers. Right, so with the minis, we used to drive around getting all the stereos and put them in the car. And then when we'd find the keys in the car, we'd nick the cars. So then we'd take the cars away and then people would start buying the cars and then basically how it escalated was from the cars to the car stereos to the, to the car accessories and then to the whole cars. And then basically I fell into doing business with a guy called Chris Berglier. Right, he's a, an old friend of mine, and basically he used to buy all the cars of us. Right, so basically we used to nick all the car stereos, the car parts, and the cars, and then we used to give all the cars to Chris. Chris went on to get nicked for the biggest ever ringing coup the country ever seen. Right, they got like the amount of cars we used to get, and this is how we went up the ladder. So we used to get so many cars, he couldn't pay us. So how could he pay us? They used to get all the all the graft of other people um, that was connected to the rave Genesis. Right, um, so we used to give him the stereos and he'd do a couple of thousand pounds, he couldn't pay us, so he'd have to pay us in graft. And then we'd get the graft and have to give it to someone to sell to get the money. And then it was like, Can you get us any more of this gear? Yeah, I can get you whatever you want. How much of this gear can I get? We well, can have what you want. All right, well, I can get you what you want. Well, can you get me five key? I don't know, I'll ask. Can you get five key? Yeah, yeah, well, put them two together, just give me a drink when you get it. So then our little network of friends from a very early age was growing financially very well and then a couple of the youngsters started traveling to Ibiza doing bits and pieces making other links with other people in Europe and then they were getting other bits and pieces sent over and as a kid growing up like after the age of 14 I don't think I really experienced real poverty because we always had some little scheme or scam going on because there was so many of us if we weren't in the fraud weren't robbing weren't stealing we were selling a bit of gear or doing other madness do you know what I'm saying so it was just crime on the whole was the one thing that I lived for growing up and anything to do with criminal financial gain is anything I was interested in anything to do with women and kids and all that sort of noncy sex stuff and all that I weren't interested in I never went down them sort of roads I weren't a seedy guy I weren't into the lap dancing gaffs or, although I frequented them occasionally I just uh -huh. the girls uh, the girls couldn't I couldn't I, get away from me man so if I, you were grafting in that though the girls come to you anyway. Yeah, I don't know because because I know they're coming to get paid. I weren't mm. interested. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. So I was good enough and handsome enough as a young man growing up to have the ability to pull myself a few salts whenever I went out. So I weren't short or shy of a, a bird when I was growing up. I weren't ever alone emotionally or affectionately. I always had a bird. Do you know what yeah. I mean, I always had a bird. Like so, I never had issues with that. Um, when did you start getting into 
serious violence because you're known as it's always been it's you're, always you're been very well known as being a violent man it's, it's, it's just from a kid from a very early kid it's just the first violent memory I have of actually like stepping up as I was in a school called Haverstock um, and basically there's we're from Kentish Town Queen's Crescent Kentish Town Camden Town and then Summers Town now, a couple of kids from Summerstown used to come to Haverstock, but we used to have wars with Cumberland, um, Summerstown, Kentish Town, and Queen's Crescent. So I was from Queen's Crescent. So basically what happened, I had a fight one day with one of the kids in my class and three of his mates from Summerstown all joined in. So then it got split up and then I had, to, had a fight with all four of them, no, three of them, one after another. And I ended up beating them all up. And then... I started realising from a very early age that I'm never, because I was always on my own, I've always been on my own, all the way through my whole criminal career. I associate with people to make money, but I've always been on my own. Everybody knows I've been on my own. I, I travel on my own, I go after my own. If I want to make money, then I'll collate the right team to make that money, and then we go our separate ways. I'm not into all these like, gangs and having it with people because they're this and that. I've always just kind of focused on making money, networking to make money and to survive better than everybody else or anybody else I've ever come into contact with because I wanted to aspire to be very wealthy as a kid. I didn't realise that I could have achieved it a lot easier as a kid. So I believed I was going to become very wealthy within the criminal world. So I'd done whatever I felt necessary to achieve the status of a gangster mm -hmm. you know so that was my only driving force as a kid growing up and when was the first time you went to the jail um I think I was 15 yeah 15 I got nicked basically what happened uh I started seeing I pulled some young bird one day um chatted her up got hold of her got off of her had a little reef and a feel because I never lost my virginity. I never lost my virginity till I was seventeen. I lost it late because I weren't into sex. I was, I was just into making money, and making friends. So, um, I met this girl, chatted her up, started flinging her, having a little flirt and a little feel up, kiss up, and then basically I went to go my separate ways. And he said to me, "I want to see you again." I was like, "Yeah, all right, whatever." So I'm going away for a couple of weeks. I said, "Yeah, all right, sweet. I'll see you when you get back." So she went to me, look, will you take this ring? So I said, for what? She said, because I know you'll have to see me then when I come back. <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah, sweet, no problem. Sweet, I'll take it. So I took it. It was only a little peso ring. I've gone home, threw it in the wardrobe, never thought nothing of it. Anyway, about, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, three, four weeks later, fucking, I'm lying in bed in Finchley Road with my mum's. Front door's come off bedroom doors come open police got like like armed old people come in like it's just gone nuts right and then it was kicked off in there one then obviously because my mum was young like when the old people come in they might have thought my mum was a girlfriend or something one of the old people slapped my mum and when they've slapped I've just, I've just gone nuts so it's I've gone nuts in the thing so I've been nicked for something like seven or eight it's all here on these things seven or eight assaults on the police officers and the robbery right because the girl for some reason, when I told the police I've robbed her. I, I, looking back with hindsight now, she must have gone home and mum said, where's your ring? Uh, 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 I got robbed. So I don't know why she said it, but uh, that was it. I got Nick for the robbery and I ended up getting Bird for the robbery. So that was my first introduction to prison. Um, assault on police officers and rob robbery. But How was, was that feeling going inside at a young age? Um... If I'm being honest, I just thought scum. I'll smash anyone's face in who says anything. So that was my mindset. If I met, I was just yeah. going in there and that was it. So the minute I walked into the holding cells in Lambeth, it was off. You're known for your boxing as well. What age did you start that? Um, nine, ten years of age. So you're young. You're handy with your fists as well at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I started boxing... <laughs> Ironically enough, because I've realised that I have to fight more than one person. So any fight I ever... I never had a fight with just one person. I've never had... No, I did. Little Johnson would give me a black eye. Yeah. 
it was a school fight, Haverstock. <laughs> How do you remember all that? It just come back. It's just come back. Because I remember, no, we had a fight at the bottom of Maitland Park and he, he punched me and mm-hmm. in my eye and my eye swelled right up and closed. But you know, when you just grab hold of someone, I couldn't let him go. And I, mm-hmm. um, just, I, can't, I can't remember what happened, but I know I never got battered. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I had a black eye and that was it. But he got, I had the better of him in the end. What but, age did you start getting into the series stuff? I've always been in it. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I wasn't. It was more like I had older brothers, right, and they was all doing stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was very competitive. So if you're doing, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Like, for, I'm going to say, I'll end up in the nightclubs at 13 years of age, right, down the West End with my dad's crocodile skin shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, giving it the bigger with me, with, 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 with me dad or my brother's shoes and trousers on, giving it the bigger, but the shoes are three, four sizes too big for me, but because yeah. they're crocs, I'm yeah. down the West End, but I, I was just one of them kids, I just wanted to be in everything and I was that guy. And people, no, people that know me know, like we had a conversation the other day, like a lot of my friends are 10 years older than me, so you got all the rave people that I was hanging around with when they was at the height of their career. Like people say, how old are you? And like, Marv, you look fantastic. I said, yeah, but I'm, I'm only 40 odd and they're all 50, 60 years of age now, do you know what I mean? So growing up as a kid, I was plugged in at the, high, at the top places because of my gameness, I suppose, because I weren't scared of anybody and I'd fight anybody anywhere. And I weren't, I'd never run. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. if you pull the blade out, it's going off. I don't care. If you pull gas out, it's going off. I don't care. If you pull the gun out, I'll try and get it. Like there was, I was, I was insane in it. So did you have no fear of dying then? No, because we spoke earlier. You've been stabbed, shot, but you've no. never backed down. Never. Your loyalty was, was too strong. That's why everybody wanted a piece of you at the time. Yeah, I was just a benefit to people, you know. And look, the way I look back at that, I think, well, I'll do the same if I was in that game. What kind of things? Anything, anything to do with violence, stabbing, shootings, cuttings, beatings. The only thing I never done was kidnapping. Because I don't know if you see the point. Just fucking shoot him, innit? What are you kidnapping him for? Send a message, go to his house, do what you're doing. Like, I weren't the person to have the rules and morals of not going to people's houses with their families. Fuck that. If we're in it, we're in it. What, you want to kill me or stab me or shoot me and you think I'm not coming to your house? Come on, man. Like, let's have it right. It's a war, isn't it? So when you're in that world, you've got to have that mindset. And I think that's what s- distinguished me from most people in that game. The rest. Yeah. What age did you start moving abroad? Did you wait to Spain? What age? No, I was in, in and out of Spain all my life. It's, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, just know. What is... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll thank Andy Gray for this because he's an old um, football hooligan. But he was a mixed race kid, 10 years older than me. I mentioned his name because he played a massive part in my growing up with the travelling. Like, these lot used to go out and they used to do some, like, sick shit. Like, they used to rob places and do things. And I'd be oh, I know what they're doing. Like, and bags of money, jewellers and all sorts of shit I used to see this little firm doing. And I was like, that's me. That's going to be me. But they'd go away with the football. So when, they, when I used to be here, they'd go around and I'd be going, I'm, I was a little rat, so the Gooners used to go away and I was part of the the, rat, the rats. We were called the Kentish Town Rats. It was a little group of us because at the time it was called cool to smoke crack and heroin because I was a heroin user and a crack user and a cocaine user up until the age of 17, 18. I was doing it as sort of as an occupational hazard. At the end of every day, I'd smoke a bit of gear, smoke a bit of crack and then smoke a bit of gear to come From what down. age? Oh, I was doing that from 13, 14. Like, I was smoking, cracking doors, and my whole family was smoking, apart from me cousin Adam. You know, like, we've all been through it, the family, you know, everyone's played their part to a certain degree. Thankfully, everybody's turned their lives around and they're in really good places now. So what we experienced growing up as kids was just immature mindsets, trying to fit in, trying to survive and trying to feed the kids and making mistakes, dealing with depression. Like my mum was a battered wife. Like my dad used to weigh her in. Like he did used to weigh her in. Like I don't, I talk fondly of my dad, but the beatings my mum used to get was horrific. Like I've seen him try to chop her head off and all sorts, you know, like, yeah. and the beatings I used to get off him, like, it, like, like, like beatings, like, 
I don't know how he used to do it. Like having kids myself, yeah. I just don't know how he used to do it. Did you, did you ever have that conversation with him at the end up? Because clearly when you speak about it, all that emotion builds yeah. up straight away. Yeah, no, because... Right, you can't under, understand stand how someone dad, you love. My, my dad, yeah, yeah, used to hold me, right, and, and punch me in my face, like, punch me in my face, like, kick me, hit me with things, like... Like, like he burnt my hand over the f fire, like because I nicked a star bar on a pack of Wrigley Spearmint gum. Burnt my hand over the fire and made me eat, you know, a cone of hot pepper sauce. Yeah. Like, like a spoonful of that, right? I had to eat two spoonfuls of that after I had my hand burnt over the fire. And then I put in a cold bath and then beat him with a belt. <laughs> Just because I nicked a star bar and a mm -hmm. fucking Wrigley Spearmint gum. Do you understand? So, yeah. Growing up, and that was like eight, nine years of age. This was the horrific treatment we used to be like objected, subjected to as a kid, right? And this wasn't just me with my brothers and sisters, but I got it the worst because my dad wasn't the dad to all my brothers and sisters. So his frustrations <laughs> for the other kids used to get taken out on me. And that's why I grew to hate him because I used to feel like arguments like, I've got to talk about it. My dad used to have a lockup out the back of the house. And he used to get all his puff delivered there, right? Like, and I'm talking half a ton, a ton of puff, right? And one day my brother blew the shed up with petrol, like blew it up, right? And I, I'm buzzing because you're getting battered. You're getting battered. Because I'm fed up with getting battered. So I was buzzing, you're getting battered. You're getting bad watch when you get in there. But when my dad come home, my, my dad called my brother and said, right, what do you think I should do with you? My brother collapsed to the floor and said, beat me. My dad told him to go to his bedroom. I was like, what the fuck? Who are you talking to? Well, I would have got fucking battered, mate. Why are you beating him? Shut up. Fuck off. Shut up. Because oh, you fucking cunt, you wanker. Like, because I couldn't understand why they're not getting beaten. Why am I always getting beaten? Then I'd get the beating because they're getting cheeky to my dad. So the... Exposure to violence was extreme from an early age, you know, and it wasn't like rarely, it was weekly. Like if my dad used to call me sometimes, if I hear my dad call me, I'd piss myself. Do you know what I mean? Like it was, it was deep, but I thanked him in the end because without that, I couldn't have dealt with what I had to go through, you know, because... Yeah. I did, I thanked him before he died. I said, you know what, Dad, I've got to thank you for all the beans you give me because of what I've been through. You know what I mean? I couldn't have got through that if I weren't, if I never had what I'd wound yeah, up. Yeah, you like, wouldn't be the person, you wouldn't have survived all the pain and more trauma you've been through man, your whole life. Um, but that makes sense to why you were so violent as well then towards people. That's why you were so ruthless. Violence was normal. Yeah. Like, like, and the level was of violence. The only thing, the only thing that can't be justified was murder, right? So anything but that, I'd do it. I'd do it, I didn't give a fuck. Like I've been nicked for loads of murders and I've been accused of loads of murders and I've done and been involved with people that have been connected to lots of things. But me personally, I've never murdered anybody. Now I've stabbed people and I've been, it's been alleged that I've shot loads of people, but I've never personally killed another human being. Do you understand that? The, the reputation I have on the road, a lot of people don't understand it, but the people that have put it out there, put it out there for a reason. So everybody says I'll kill people, but what happens? I'll tell you what happens. Right? You've got a problem. I turn up at your house and I'll weigh you in and I'll beat you to an inch of your life. And then I ask you, what do you want to do about it? What do you want to do about it? And I'll keep coming back. And I'll keep serving you until you tell me, look, I don't want no more problems. I don't want problems. That's it. End of problem. See you later. And if you want to have it with me, come and see me. Because I'll, yeah, here's a gun. Show me. Do what you're doing. Do you understand? Like, further than when we talk, there's another story where that happened with a little firm from Manchester. They like, try to take me away and I'll give them the tool to kill me. I like, do what you're doing, mate. Right? So the world that I lived in was a world I accepted. And the rules that I played by, I found that not a lot of people played by the rules correctly. Yeah. So the choices I made in that mindset that I had was pure insanity. Like I know 
how insane I used to be because reflecting back now, I actually asked myself, how the fuck could you believe that was right? How? Like, what's the matter with you? Like, it's, 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 it's madness. It's not like if, but, or maybe. Do you know what I mean? Like, how, how can you think it's okay to mm. stab somebody, yeah, 12 or 15 times for chatting to your bird? How's it okay to shoot somebody because they don't pay you no money? Do you know what I mean? How's it okay to boot someone's door off and weigh them in in front of their family because they've let you down? Like, do you understand? Like, it's just what we accept as normal behaviour is barbaric insanity. But again, that's a wee bit of self-harming as well, isn't it? Where you're, 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 you're no scared to die, whether you cut me, punch me, give me it. You're willing to accept it because you've had beatings your whole fucking yeah, life. Yeah, that's it. Listen, a beating, like nothing, like, uh, mm. punch, people that know me know, I'm, I'm not doing it or saying things to look special or it's just I don't know how I've got that gift but looking back retrospectively now I know why I don't feel pain I know why I'm not scared because the trauma the programming I had from six seven eight nine years of age has got my brain ready for trauma so nothing was affecting me like trauma because it wasn't trauma mm -hmm. because I'd been so traumatized as a kid it was normalised as an adolescent and then as a teenager and then as a man. And it was a, a belief that I accepted and you live by the rules. Is that why people wanted to be your friend then? Because you were ruthless and fearless? I believe so. I believe, I never had no friends. Well, jumping forward, what made me realise more than anything was the day I, after I got shot and I'm in hospital, right? And I'm getting told I'm never going to be able to walk again. Never gonna, I'm never going to be able to put 100% weight on that leg. Right, that's what they said. I'm never going to be able to bend no more than 90 degrees. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be able to put 100% weight on it. Do you know what I'm saying? That's what they said to me, right? So I'm lying in hospital now, ruined, believing that I'm fucked. There's nothing I can do in my life. I'm only known for violence. I'm only known for grafting. I'm only known for getting... I never took nothing off anybody. Mm -hmm. I nicked my own money. I was a good money getter. That's what I was as a kid. And I went out and I got my money. I never got laid on gear. You never laid me on gear to, like, what? No, 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 no. Like, but I'd invest my money as a banking structure for the gear. So I couldn't put my money in the bank. So if I had a couple of hundred grand, then I'd buy a couple of Kia Sniff, a couple of bits of puff, a couple of tools, a couple of cars, and I'd bank them and then give them to people that could sell that I could trust. So my banking system was buying other products. I weren't really a drug dealer, so to speak. And when I did venture down that road, I had more debt because no one paid and I had to pay other people. So it was a, it was a, it was, it was a world that I realized wasn't profitable for me to be in that world. Um, I've gone off a little bit there. Yeah, but it shouldn't. So I'm in hospital. <laughs> I'm expecting all my people, all my brothers, all my soldiers, all my man them, yeah, to come and see me. Right, because I've never, I've never asked anyone for money. I've only, I'll tell you, I've asked three people in my life for money, right? And everybody that knows me know that I've always grafted my own money. I've always nicked my own money and I've borrowed money off friends that I've given opportunities to and money to in the past. I've never gone to a stranger and, and begged. Do you know what I mean? I've always gone and got it. And to me, if you're skinny, you've got to get money. You can't punt money. I'm, I've never been a thief punt. I've always been a go get them. So I'm expecting my people, is it? How many people have I looked after? I've looked after fucking thousands. I've stopped people getting ironed out. I've stopped people getting served up. I've stopped people getting out of prison. I've put money on, you've got no money. I'll go and rob a van to give you money because you're my pal. That's the kind of villain I was, do you know what I mean? I'll be like, what, you got no money? Yeah, I'll come with me. Oh, Marv, I don't want to do that. Are you joking? Why? Oh, Marv, I'm scared. This is, I don't want, all right, wait here, I'll be back in a couple of hours. And I'll go and nick money, come back and say, how much does he need? There you go. Don't fucking tell anybody I'll give you that though, right? Do you understand? So I was very integral in what I've done because I've done everything so everybody could grow. Do you understand? And then when I was lying in that hospital, man, and no one come to see me, it broke my heart. It broke my heart. And that was the day I sort of said, fuck them, because I don't need none of them. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And then that's when the penny started dropping over my convalescence of what my relationships were with all these people. You were getting used? I was being used, yeah. And I'd been groomed. I allowed myself to be groomed. 
I allowed myself to be groomed. And then I groomed my cousins. I groomed my youngsters. Do you understand? Yeah. But I never groomed them in a way so I could benefit. I groomed them in a way so they could benefit through legal activities. Yeah. But all the way, it was grooming. Yeah. I was grooming them to do the easy jobs the best way and benefit themselves. I was profiting a little bit, but they were, they were growing faster than me. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So I never looked at me giving them help as me being a drug dealer. That was just me getting him in front and putting him yeah. on the mat. So you were shot five times? Yeah. You yeah. must count your blessings, brother, that you're here. Do you know what? you got to go through the photos, right? Yeah, well, you send me them and we'll throw the photos up. Yeah. So what's the story behind this? The show was a build-up of uh, hating and jealousy from my perspective, right? So I can only assume this because there's no real facts, but the evidence that presented itself after made me realise certain things and you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work it out so um, after leading the life of criminal sort of engagement moving up the ladder from nicking car stereos going through to car parts cars houses burglaries um, robberies I got nicked for a security van um, got nicked for a couple of shootings. Um, I was under investigation for 19 shootings, um, 19 murders, um, four shootings. Um, and basically I went away for that. Um, the case fell apart down to the old bill trying to fit us up. Um, basically I'll talk about that because when we got nicked, the evidence was that we was a pristine hit team at killing people for the London underworld or the, the English underworld, right? And we would take care of anyone's problems and do things and bits and pieces. And then um, basically the police is, uh, police forensic examiner said that the firearm that we used was pristine, brand spanking new, never been used. And we was elite. We were so forensically aware they weren't able to get anything off this gun. They weren't able to do this, they weren't able to do that. And then basically when we went to trial, the gun that they brought in as evidence was about 50 years old, 40 years old. And because of that legality, we got the not, guilty, not, we got, we got the not guilty. And then basically my co-defendant got, my co-defendant took a plea bargain prior to this discovery on getting no more than four years. No, they said you're gonna get no more than five years if you take a plea bargain. So then we got found guilty by association to that firearm he pleaded guilty to. Do you know what I mean? And then we went away. Yeah. So he goes away and then it all come out. There was a lot of skullduggery going on, a lot of lying, cheating, a um, bit of informing. You know, people got killed um, over meaningless acts. Absolutely, someone's bird cheated. Do you know what I mean? And then it just escalated into lie after lie after lie. Numerous people getting stabbed and shot, people getting killed. One of my good friends got ironed out. Um, then it, it, police got involved. Police was mentioned. Um, it, was just, it was just a whole heap of bullshit. So I'm in Belmarsh on the unit expecting to get 36 years recommended on a guilty. And this was the penultimate turning point for my life. So I'm in there, I've got 36 years. <coughs> At the time of my life, I had crooked briefs, crook, crooked screws, crooked everyone. Yeah. So basically this, I had a brief to bring in phones and everything else. So he had brought phones, gear, everything else. Um, so I've got a phone, so I'm speaking to my people who are connected to the older lot, right? So I won't mention no names, but they're connected to the older lot. So what I've said to the older lot through my mate is, look, we're gonna do 36 years here, now, I'm not asking for hand that. I've got a couple of hundred grand of my own money, yeah? I want to buy a slot on your transport because I know you lot are getting graft over here every week. I want to buy a slot on the transport so we can feed, because it was four of, three of us nicked, right? But another four people, so seven of us nicked under the same investigation, right? And we've got to feed each other for the next 30 years, mate. We get guilty. I don't want you lot to pay me. I want to pay for it myself. So we want to buy... A slot on the transport. Don't worry, son, we're going to look out of you. Don't worry about nothing. You're good as gold. You're fucking proper. You're 100%. Yeah, sweet, lovely. Laughing. So now I'm thinking, sweet, isn't it? 
So a couple of months went by, Christmas hit. So the missus come up, she said, mate, you dropped off uh, five quid today. Boris, because he's dead now, so I can say it. So Boris dropped off five quid today. I said, for what? She said, uh, it's for um, you, Doc, and um, Daryl. I said, for what? She was like, I don't know, it's Christmas, I'd imagine. I said, are you fucking joking? I've asked him for a fucking slot. Look, ring him up and tell him to come and pick it back up. She's like, what are you on about? I said, ring him and tell him to come and pick the fucking money back up. So he's come and picked the money back up. I said, look, do you know what? I don't want nothing to do with you lot, mate. How the fuck can you send me five grand Christmas? I said, I give more than that to me kids, mate. And you want me to split that three ways with my, pump, with my curry D's? I said, you lot of scumbags, mate. So from that point, I thought, said, you know what? Fuck these lot, man. Do you know what I mean? I don't need them. They can't pay me. They can't buy me. They can't own me. So fuck them. So I just sort of said, look, no disrespect, chaps. I said, but when I get out, I want nothing to do with none of you. Yeah, so just drop me the fuck out. And basically, I'm a pretty spiritual guy and I had a conversation with my spirit guy and I just sort of said, look, this is prior to the the old gun turning up. So when Nick for these pristine Mac-10 silences mm -hmm. and all the bollocks and all the bullshit and all the walkie-talkies and everything, right? So we're sitting there. So I've just said to the energy, I said, look, do me a favour. I promise you this now, yeah? I will never hurt another soul for any of these cunts ever again. Never do anything. They can't do, I won't do nothing. I won't, in fact, I'll leave the country. How about that? I'll leave this country. So I said, all right, sweet. You'll get no more than five years. My, that's what my, the message I got now. My missus can confirm this. So I've got, I'm, I'm, cat, I'm double cat aid or, yeah, double cat aid on the unit. I said, babe, you never guess what? She said, what? I said, I'm getting no more than five years. She said, oh, shut up, Marv. She said, because no, uh, my solicitors are telling her you're getting no less than 36 years, right? <laughs> so she said, Marv, come on, please. I'm staying, I'm waiting. I said, no, babe, please believe me. I'm getting no less than five years. I'm, I'm doing no more than five years. I'm not going to spend no more than five years in prison, I promise you. So she went, Marv, Marv, please come on, babe. I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but either I'm going to escape or escape. I've only got. Always, I've got. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be on my toes forever. So as long as you're prepared to be on your toes forever, yeah, stay. If not, get on with it. So she said, "All right, sweet." And I got that message. I did get that message that I'm gonna do no more than five years. You're not gonna spend more than five years in prison. So I actually believed at that stage I was gonna get um, escape, but lo and behold, an escape plan got put into motion. Right. So. Because we was getting all these, all these but these years, what we decided to do was get taken off the bus because a couple of my pals have been taken off the buses over the last few years. One was, three of my pals kicked themselves out of one bus. There was Nick for a few robberies. They kicked themselves out of one bus. And another bus, my pals hijacked the whole bus and took it, the bus and then got off and escaped. So we were trying to find a way to escape. And then we said, we'll, we'll, we'll do the escape, blah, blah, blah. And anyway... When I got this message, I thought, that's it, I've got to escape, I've got to escape, I've got to escape, it's got to be one of them because I'm going to be on my toes forever. So every opportunity I had to escape, so I'm doing no more than five years, I was looking for these, so cutting a very long story short, we're on the, we're on, yeah, we're on the unit. No, we're not on the unit then, we was on, in Belmarsh, high security, and then basically, we're banged up one afternoon, and um, it's dinner time, so dinner time's gone six, seven, eight o'clock. We haven't been fed. But I'm one of them, I'm very vocal in prison. Very, very vocal and very violent. Strip cells and all that was places that I found comfort. So I mean, the people doing my head on the wing, I'm, oh, I'm gonna serve this cunt up in a minute. Three days in the strip cell, and get me head together. So, my escape from the prison reality was the strip cells and fighting with the screws down the block. So. I was very argumentative in prison. So now we ain't getting fed, I'm on my door. Governor, what the fuck? So uh, but we got to change the, the, the all right, whatever. All of a sudden, the nonces, the nonces are getting fed before us, right? So nah, I'm not happy, right? Because that, that, that was like blatant disrespect. So I'm like, nah, fuck this, that's a liberty. What the fuck? Watch when we come out. Watch when we come out. So we come out. So I've gone straight up to the SO and the PO. So how the fuck can you treat me worse than a fucking nonce? He said, go and get your dinner. I said, who are you talking to, you cheeky looking cunt? With that, he's tried to headbutt me. But as he's tried to headbutt me, I've just uppercutted him, hooked him and headbutted him back, smashed him in the teeth, headbutted the other screw, headbutted him again, 
threw him on the floor. I've run across the hallway, like the, the well, I've run across the wing to the stairs where the screw's coming down the stairs. And I've volleyed him up the stairs, dragged him. From, my other two Cody's have done the other two screws. So now we've done all the screws on the wing. An inmate, a fucking inmate jumped over the hot plate and pressed the panic button. What? I'm telling you. No now, way. And Belmarsh as well. Belmarsh. I'm telling you, 2002, I take a wicked oath, house block four, right? An inmate on the servery. We done all the screws. We done the screws, mate. Right? And the inmate jumped over the hot plate and pressed the fucking panic button. Anyway, lo and behold, the screws have come, bent us all up. So now it's on, right? It's on. I'm, I'm just... I'm not being big-headed, but it's on and it's violent and it's fighting. So it doesn't matter. Your screw is on. As soon as my hands are free, it's off. As soon as my door's open, it's off. As soon as you're serving me food, it's off. So it's just off, 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 off. After two days, the screws have come to my cell in the block and said, oh, but what's the problem? I said, I want to exercise my fucking codes, mate. What's the matter with you, you fucking slags? Let me out of my fucking cell my codes, yeah? And I said, oh, but, oh, look, we want to, the governor wants to speak to you, but... We want to get you out of your cell. Are you going to be okay? I said, what do you want to speak to me about? He said, no, what he wants to speak, he wants to speak to you and your two co-defendants together. Are you going to be okay? I said, yeah, yeah, as long as I'm with my co D, He's like, I don't give a fuck. So he said, come on in. So they've got us out and they've took us in, they've took us into the adjudication room. And um, the governor said to me, uh, how would you feel about going to Pentonville? So I was like, no, let me rewind that, right? Because in the morning, what's happened? When it's kicked off, I've head butted the floor and I've split my head open because I've just shown them they can't hurt me. So when they're bending my arms, trying to hurt my arms, you can't fucking hurt me, you mugger, you stupid. Look, smash, smash, I oh, fucking cunt. Break it, break it, you stupid cunt. Because that was the mindset I had. So when I was in prison, and people that know me that have done bird with me, they, they can confirm all this it's not, I'm not making it up it just happened right it's just how it was so it's kicking off kicking off kicking off kicking off kicking off so then the next morning that's it the next morning I've come to go on the phone that's it so I'm coming off exercise I'm, I've got my phone call so I'm on a 10 man unlock which means you're not allowed out your cell they're not allowed to open your door without 10 screws in right gear an SO and a PO right so I'm on a 10 man unlock so they've opened me up to use the phone so I've come out, I'm on the phone. So, and as I'm on the phone, the governor's come to do his rounds, right? So I'm on the phone and I've said to the governor, I said, sweetheart, do me a favour, do me a favour. I said, see, see them lot, yeah? Tell them lot, I want them to fucking shoot every five foot six bald-headed mug that walks out of this fucking jail. Otherwise, they'll never talk to me ever again when I get out. Do you get me? Tell them, I don't give a fuck. Every bald five foot six geese that comes out of this jail, I want him fucking shot. You fucking mug. Slam the phone down, I banged up, right? The next morning, they've, they've called me down, Herbert, Herbert, the governor wants to speak to you. With you co-defendants, calm, chill out. I said, yeah. So I've gone in the office. So I've gone in the office, walked in the office, um, in the adjudicating room. And so the governor just said to me straight away, how do you feel about a guy in Pentonville? <laughs> you try to shut you out. I was like, Pentonville? Sweet as that. Why? Because Pentonville's on the plot. Mm -hmm. It's my manor. That's like, where all my pals are, right? So... I said, yeah, I'll go to Pentonville. What's the script? He said, well, you're all going to get split up. So you're going to go Pentonville, he's going to go hide down and he's going to go thing. So I was like, are you all right with that? They was like, yeah, because I was happy going to Pentonville because I can get what I want in Pentonville. So I said, yeah, sweet, no problem, no problem. Little did I know the coup, the bastard done it. It was an absolute proper move. So they've got me to um, Pentonville, but because I'm a cat A, they can't house me on the wing or they can't exercise me. I can't be out of my cell because it's not facilitated for a cat A. Because I was a cat A, I wasn't allowed out of my cell. So I was on 24 hour banger until they went through red tape. <laughs> Fucking slags, mate. <laughs> Did you not even think uh, of that at the start? No, no, no I'm <laughs> getting to the bill. I thought, yeah, I'll get into the bill, I'll yeah. get into the bill. Anyway, so a week's gone by. A week's gone by and I'm thinking these fucking slags. Now, I've, I've paid for a parcel to come in. I've got I've got drink, I've got puff, mm -hmm. I've got snout, I've got everything in a parcel waiting to come to me, but no one's allowed on my spur but the security. So the crooked screws couldn't get on my spur. They couldn't come on my to my cell. No one was allowed to my cell apart from the security. So what's happened? 
I've kicked off with the security one day. I said, fucking get the security down here. I want to speak to him. I said, listen, I'm not having this. This is fucking bollocks. 24 hour bang up. This is illegal. You know it's illegal. All I'm asking you to do, yeah, is let me have a phone call, please. Oh, let me speak to my family, please. All right, Herba, we'll let you out and use the phone, right? We'll let you out and use the phone, but please, right? Don't create any problems. I was like, oh, sweet, Gov, you're blind. Absolute blind. I said, look, I'm going to take a liberty, Gov, yeah? Is there any chance I can get a shower? I said, no, we can't let you have a shower, Herba. you got to have just the phone and that's it. So you never had a shower in fucking I weeks? Wasn't allowed, I wasn't allowed nothing. I wasn't allowed out of my cell. I wasn't allowed out of the cell, I promise you. So then, but I'm on the phone now, right? Lo and behold, they've opened up for exercise, right? So they've opened up for exercise. So I'm like, everyone's coming out and saying, Marv, is that you? And I'm like, yeah, what's happening? They said, oh, on the phone. I said, oh, all right, sweet. So I can't even chat to you lot, man. I was going to take it off the phone. I'll speak to you in a bit. So now I'm on the phone now. So I'm thinking, hold on. All I've got to do is run out in the yard. If I get out in the yard, I'm sweet as a nut. Fuck it. So I've uh, yeah, all right, sweet, all right, yeah, lovely, 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 lovely. All right, I'll speak to you soon, baby. All right, bye. As I put the phone down, I'll just, like, the, 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 the screws in a semicircle around me on the phone. So I'll just run through them and run onto the yard. As I've run onto the yard, people was talking about me being a hitman anyway. They were saying, oh, he's the hitman for this team, he's a hitman for this family, he's a hitman for that family. Oh, it was all the bollocks. I weren't a hitman for anybody. We just done things for our friends that just yeah. had needed to be done at the time. So basically, when I've gone on the yard now, um, I've gone on the yard now, I've said, well, I ain't going in. But unbeknown to myself, right, they'd planned a sit-in on this day, right? So I've gone out there and all the, all the inmates were planning on a sit-in anyway. So we're on the yard now, so I'm walking around saying, look, don't go in, don't go in. No, we're not, we're having a sit-in, we've we planned it. So now people are throwing food out and all bits and pieces out. Cutting a very long story short, no. The kid that set up the sit-out Right. After about seven hours, he's gone up to the gate and asked if he can come back in. When he's asked to come back in, the kids on the yard have heard him ask to go back in, and they've weighed him in. They've pulled him away from the gate, they've weighed him in, punted his lungs, really, really, like, fuck this kid up. Um, I don't know why we got rushed off, but he was in critical condition. Um, and then, I think it was about half 11, 12 o'clock at night, They've come with about 750 officers from all around the country. Like, come. But what happened is, yeah, me and there was a, there was a guy called Eddie Ash from over South London. Um, him and his brother was prolific um, villains um, back in the day. Me and Eddie made relationships through my previous sentence in Swellside in 1993 when I got nicked for an armed robbery. So basically, we're on the yard. And everyone's talking about having a fight with the screws when they come. But when all these screws turned up, there was like 750 of them. Like they come in like marching. And it was all like lined up, lines of them, lines of them, lines of them, with all the shields on, right? So we're standing there. So they've all gone, right, sit down, sit down. And they've all started saying now, after they've served some cunt up in the afternoon, it's a peaceful protest, right? <laughs> it's a peaceful protest. So I've, I, I ain't sitting down. Because I ain't come out for no peaceful protest. So I said, I ain't fucking sitting down. These mugs, what's the matter with you? And he's like, I ain't sitting down. So all the screws were coming in. They were like lined up across the whole yard, right? So I said, I can't remember if it was a, it was a roll up or a joint, right? But we're standing there smoking. So I said, do you want a bit of this, Ed? He said, yeah. And then we heard, Herbert, Herbert, is that you? I said, who's that? Who's that? He said, that's Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is head of security from Wandsworth, right? Six foot eight like proper lump of a man. I said, what's all this about, Herbert? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, someone got served up earlier and I've been too scared to come back in, Gov. You know what it's like. He said, are you going to come back in now? I said, uh, I was going to finish my... Would you like some, Ed? He's, Eddie's had a puff. I said, yeah. And then we cut a long story short. We've walked back in, gone banged up, ended up getting seven days loss of everything. And then that's when I got moved to the unit. And then I wasn't allowed off the unit then. And I was on the unit in Belmarsh. How but, long was that for? Um, a year on the unit. So you were in the unit for a year? Yeah. Did you get your five? Um, that's what I did get, yeah. five and a half years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Went up, we got found not guilty of all the other case, the other mm -hmm. charges, and then got found guilty by association mm -hmm. to the firearm that my co-defendant pleaded guilty yeah. to. Yeah, because you, know? you were looking at all sorts of murder charges, yeah, it robberies. It was, yeah. just, it, was, it, was a, it was an investigation that we went on, basically... 
Um, they found the lockup with all sorts of guns and materials, my DNA and bits and pieces in the lockup, other firearms. Um, apparently, the police cross contaminated um, the firearms so they couldn't pursue the overall case. So they had to take the plea bargain to the one firearm and we got found guilty by a So What did you do when you came out? Um, we could do, I went straight to Spain. That was, that was what happened because basically on that sentence is when I realised that everybody I've been working with was no value, right? And they're all using cunts that work with old Bill. Well, not my people, some of the older lot. Not all of the older lot, but some of them work with old Bill. And it came out in their death because my mate got ironed out and it was kind of in-house. So I won't go into detail with that too much because it could be could cause issues for other people. But yeah, I realised I can't have it with these people no more. So fuck them, I'm leaving this country. And then one of my pals had moved to Spain, a, a female, Diddy, she moved to Spain um, a couple of years prior to me getting a sentence. So she's always like, come out here, come out here, come out here. So I just thought, fuck it, when I get out, I'm coming to Spain. So I've got out. I got out 2006. I can't remember what I got. Ah, April the 10th. April the 10th. April the 17th. We had dinner at the Jamie Oliver restaurant for my girlfriend's um, birthday. And then basically I had to see me license out for six months. After six months, I was fucked off to Spain. And that was it. I went over to Spain um, with the intentions to just become a multi-millionaire like I know I was just going to go full steam ahead full steam ahead yeah that was my only that was the only plan like do what I've been doing in England but in Spain and that's what I've done yeah what kind of stuff were you doing over there everything everything well you, you didn't have to rob anything over there it was kind of weird because the drugs is there the violence is there and the debts are there but you choose what you want to do so I got involved in a bit of the drugs for a little while, but then I realised very quick that there's a lot of dirty snakes in that game, right? So I'll give you one example. Um, a friend of mine come to me one day and said, Marv, do me a favour. My pal's doing a trade today, but he's a bit scared. Would you mind watching him for me? I was like, yeah, sweet, not a problem. He said, would you go with him? I said, yeah, not a problem. Little did I know that the geezer has asked me to go on the job has set the job up to get robbed. Imagine that. And he's supposed to be my friend. Do you know what I mean? So I'm sitting there, I'm watching this play go down. I've gone to these other people that are buying the product. I said, you know what, mate? I ain't being funny. I said, but something funny's going on there. If I was you, I'd get out of here, you know? Get your power out of there. This ain't right, mate. They're, they're not my people. My power I'm here for is who he works with. These are not my people, you know? Like, get your mate out of there. They don't seem right. Anyway, cut a very long story short. It turned out that they... They were going to rob us, but the person that was in the gaff could speak fluent Spanish, but he's acting dumb, right? So they think he's dumb, he ain't got a clue. So they're, <laughs> they're talking and he can hear everything they're yeah. saying. So he's actually rung them up and said, yeah, it's on here. So anyway, that's the level of people you've got over there. Also, the other people that I've done favours for and they put me in a position where I could have been killed. You know, like someone's asked me to do him a favour, to get him a product in a certain area, um, and how it works in Europe is, if I do business with you, me and you are buying a couple of hundred bits or half a ton, right? And the trade's going on, then you will send someone to sit with my people and I will send someone to sit with your people. So if anything goes wrong, you've all got a body to take it out on, right? So no one takes liberties, the deal gets done proper. So someone's asked me to do them a favor and I've done them a favor, right? Lo and behold, it turns out that the geezer that asked me to do him a favour, he asked me to get him a bit of puff. So I've got him a bit of puff in, in, in Holland. Um, and then basically, when it got to Holland, he told me that it wasn't good enough. It was shit. It wasn't what we ordered. So then I've had murders with the, the Moroccan people that have sent it because I'm saying, no, they're my people. He ain't going to lie to me. You're mad. You're crazy. They're not going to lie to me, bro. Yeah, I want to back it. Where can I back it? you got to get someone to come pick it up. So he said, we've got no one there to pick it up. Just ask him to sell it and get what you can and we'll have a bust up. So I said, all right, sweet. So he sold it for 1,100 quid, 1,100 to 1,400 quid. He sold it. Anyway, fast forward a year, I've picked this same fellow up to do something 
driving down the road. And this is to show the mentality of the people in Spain, right? This is how vicious it was. So I'm driving down the road with him and I've heard him on the phone to his mate. Listen, I ain't left that gear there for a year for you to pull my pants down. Mate, they're five grand a pop. They're my eggs and you got to do this, you got to do that. And I was like... Your best friend fuck you. Wow, I thought these cunts have driven me over. Mm -hmm. But what you got to understand is I got left as a body. I got left as a body to get ironed out if he pulled a stroke. The stroke get pulled and yet you could have got took out. I could have got taken out. Why didn't you get took out? Because they believed me. So they actually punished their person who delivered it. That's what I'm saying to you. They yeah. punished him. And I know he got punished. He got punished. He got punished. So I know he got punished. somebody else got fucking weighed in. Yeah, he got served and because fucked up Because they thought you were telling the truth and he was the one that was yeah. lying. Yeah, And he got fucked up and kicked and out of And it was your best friend took the pass. He wasn't my best friend. He was just, it was, it was an associate, associate that I linked with when I was there that I thought I had my back. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so basically I've drove, when I've heard that conversation, I've just drove back to the Moroccan fella. And I've walked in there, I said, how are we doing, my friend? I won't mention no names, but I'll give him a cuddle. I said, oh, I remember that bit of gear I had a few last year. He went, yeah. I said, this fat cunt's going to pay you for it. He's like, what, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, what do you mean, what am I talking about, you fat cunt? If you forgot who got you them eggs. You forgot who got you them eggs, you fucking tramp. Yeah? Now you're paying him, or I'm going to kill you. It's up to you, so you can do what you want to do. But I'm telling you now, if he ain't happy, I'm going to kill you. You fucking fat cunt. I could have been killed for you a year ago and you're trying to talk about you fucking horrible cunt and then basically that got sorted out he sorted that out and then the same fella had someone over for a couple of ton of puff right so someone from England's rung me up said Marv yeah someone's had me over someone's done this someone, this is the stamp on it I said you ain't gonna believe this he said what I said I'm only sitting with him he said, shut up. I said, I'm fucking telling you, get over. So they've come over to Spain. So I've said to the same fella, see that bit of work you got? You offered me for cheap, cheap, cheap. He went, yeah. I said, yeah, ain't yours, is it? It's his. Said, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, mate, talk to him. I said, well, mate, what are you doing with my gear? He's like, ah. But then he ended up getting nicked, bringing the, because they, they, they made him bring it back to England then. They said, right, now for your punishment, take it back to England. So they've loaded up a car, done a few bits, put it in the slaughter. And they've all got nicked on the way back to England. Do you know what I mean? So the karma come mm -hmm. back and hit him. So I uh, I learned very early in Spain. That was within the first six, seven months of me getting over there. Like, if you've got an, an exit for any product, then you're in. You're in. So I had exits for things. And I had, but the people I was working with were no value. So I realised very quick that there's slags over there and you get killed over there. There ain't, ain't like England where you go on a meet where people want to talk about yeah. sorting it out no 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 mm -hmm. in Europe you get ironed yeah, out for pulling strokes yeah but you've got jokes. the Russians the Irish the Moroccans mate, even the Spanish fuck about they you don't got, fuck about no, 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 mate, they play by the rules yeah. right and they, that's how serious so then I started thinking well what am I going to do over here and then one of my mates just said to me Marv do you know what you'd be better off doing collecting debts I was like what do you mean he said the debts he said do you know how much money he's fucking owed out here he said people are owing he said and you'll collect it mate so then basically I fell into collecting debts, doing bits and pieces. Um, the one story I can tell you about was uh, the the Russians and the Bulgarians. They were Russian, but it was a Russian and Bulgarian mix. I don't know how it happened, but it was. Um, basically, a guy come to me one day, said that uh, um, I've got a three million pound, three to four million pound villa. Right? He said, but it's getting repossessed because the people I've rented to ain't paid no rent and they won't move out. They've turned it into a brothel and they won't move out. So, cutting a very long story short, I've ended up turning up at the gaff. Well, it ain't really long story. So I've turned up at the gaff. Um, there's a security guard there. I'll put it on a security guard. So the story that I've gone there with is that this is my uncle, right? That I've invested all my money in before I went to prison to buy me a house, to invest. So when I come home, I've got somewhere to live or something to make money. He's bought the house with all the money we've invested and you've rented it and now you ain't paid £170,000 in rent and it's getting repossessed. I want my fucking money, mate. You owe me my money. I want my money. Like, to me, you, it was, I was in half of the, well, 20% of the building, do you know what I mean? And I was out of fifty grand in, so I believed it was mine. It's my ass. I'm in it. So where's my fucking money? Oh, it ain't me. It's my partner. It's my partner. So I made him take me to his partner's ass. I, obviously in Spain, and I got nicked for the firearm anyway, so you can carry firearms over there. And it's pay not- Pay your way out, pay your way out. Well, you can't pay your way out, but 
you can pay for everything to be stalled. So you can't pay your way out, but because of the new laws now, basically you pay and then it gets put to the bottom of the pile. You pay, it gets put to the bottom of the pile. When you turn up, you've been out of trouble for so long, it's relatively illegal to bang someone up that's not a, mm -hmm. a threat to the state security or whatever. So because you've turned your life around, you yeah. ain't been in any trouble, it doesn't make sense to put you in prison. So that's how they sort of work it out. Um, yeah, so carrying a gun over there. So the partners turned up, I've slapped him up and bullied him up, made him open the safe, slapped him, being aggressive. Where's my money? I want my money. How are you going to pay me back my fucking money? He said, well, look, I'm going to give you 50% of this club because I'm, I'm not, me. I, I, my partner's coming out and I'm going to have you in as my partner. But you need to come back tomorrow to sign the paperwork with the solicitors and the bits and pieces. So I said, all right, sweet. So I'm buzzing now, thinking I'm going to have my own lap dancing gaff in my bay, uh, Mars the man, uh, six, 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 six. Anyway, so I pulled up with the guy that shot me, Mark Ashman. So as we pulled up, I've looked down the, the slope and there's 10 to 12, 10 to 12 lumps. Russians? Yeah, Russians and Bulgarians. They don't fuck yeah. about either. And they were lumps, they were yeah. lumps, right? But you know, like, as the cars stopped, they've all turned and looked so they've seen me, they've seen me. So they've seen me. I can't drive off now. Do you know what I mean? I'm Marvin. Even if there's 20, 12 people, have you still got that mentality? People, people know me. It? People know me, man. People know me. I'm not. It's just it has to get done, isn't it? It has to get done. I've done what I had to be done. Willing to take a beating? Yeah. Are potentially killed? Yeah. Is this? I was. I was. Man, fucking nuts mentality, man. That's a crazy mentality to have. It's living that life, isn't it? Yeah. Living that life. That's what it is. As I pulled up with Mark, pulled up, I said, come on, Mark. He said, I ain't getting out. I said, what? What do you mean? You ain't getting out. Come on, man, we've got to do this. He's like, fuck that, I ain't getting out. So I was like, ah, oh, fuck this, we've got to. So I've jumped out of the motor, walked up to the fight, first fella. First fella owes me money, straight away, where's my money, mate? Because now, obviously, my adrenaline's going, right? And I weren't shitting myself, but I just thought, I've got to play my part. I've got to play this part. So I've got to play my part. So where's my fucking money, mate? Where's my money? My friend, the guy to the my right, my friend, my friend. I said, mate, where's my money? I'm not here to talk to any cunt but you. Where's my fucking money? Are you going to pay me my money? My friend, my friend, we can go the easy way or we can go the hard way. And when I heard that, I just thought, here we go. So I switched on him, put my hand down the back of my trousers. I said, mate, you're going to fucking pay me my money? Yes or no? That's the only question I've got for you. You're going to pay me my fucking money? Yes or no? And he looked me up and down and he went, you take hashish? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll take yeah. hashish. And he said, then you get paid. Yeah. I said, when? He said, come back tomorrow and we'll pay you. Mm -hmm. So kind of very long story short, I went back the next day, got paid half in puff and a little bit of cash. And they said, look, can we pay you the rest of another day? Like, we're a bit caught up, tied up. Da, da, da. I said, yeah, whatever. Not a problem. Do you think you, would have get, that you wouldn't have got paid if you'd ever jumped out of the car? No. How? Why would they pay you? Yeah. They would have just said, oh, his arsehole's gone. Pussy, yeah. 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 His arsehole's gone. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? But the Russians and the Bulgarians was using the Spanish people. Do you understand? Yeah. So they weren't prepared to go to war for the Spanish person. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. The Spanish person most probably got in debt. Do you know what I mean? He's most probably working something off, created this problem. Do you know what I mean? And they weren't prepared to go to war for him. I'm not saying that I backed them up and they shit themselves. What I'm saying is it didn't make sense to call it on there and then with this lunatic who yeah. was standing in front of them because yeah. I made the impression in Spain that I was a lunatic because I was now I know you were yeah like I, I, it doesn't I was on my own so I, I was going on meetings with 10, 15 geezers but because I had my tool I didn't give a fuck because I'm doing people I'm not getting done do you know what I'm saying? So mm. my head was in that space all the yeah. time no matter what See when you got to do a security guard fan or any kind of robbery were you buzzing? Were you yeah. excited? Yeah. Yeah. Always. Anything that it's just, it's just, it's always a means to an end, but I never pretended, like it weren't like, I never told everybody what I'd done. I weren't one of them bragging, oh, I'm a blagger, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. I, 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 I nicked my money quietly. I got nicked for one arm robbery. Okay. I got nicked for one arm robbery, but it's alleged that I was at it for 15 years. Do you understand? So the old Bill had a relationship with me. I had a relationship with them. Right, if they caught me, my hands went up. Do you know what I mean? If you had the evidence, I was guilty. Not a problem. I always got caught and they never had the evidence. 
It ain't mm. about what they know, it's about what they can prove. It ain't my rules, it's their rules. So I'm not here trying to brag or boast about what I got away with. But what I'm saying to you is that the lifestyle that I led, I was very successful. And what I like to think about now is, is um, what's the word called? Damn! <laughs> It'll pop up. I made it to be the most successful criminal I could be mm -hmm. by amounted to nothing. Do you understand? Like, yeah. And that's the one thing that's always, that has resonated with me over the last five years, the the impact I could have made using different products. And yeah. We'll touch on all that in a bit. Mm. When you get shot five times, how was that motion for you? How was that experience? Do you know what? Like, everybody that knows me knows, and the people that see me recover, the people that was around me through my convalescence will know that I'm not exaggerating. It was just part and parcel with life, mate. You know, it was just something that happened that I had to get over and get through and get on with. Like, And where did you get shot? Um, I got shot once, and I'll, I'll give you the picture as well. The picture's yeah. here. I got, I got, so I got, first shot, I got, I've turned up, <clears throat> right. I'll tell you the, the cover story for me getting shot. Okay. Right? So the cover story was basically a few a few couple of months before the shooting, right? I'm I've got a driver that I'm paying lumps of money. So we might have got maybe forty to seventy grand in the space of three four months in wages, right? And he was getting busted up, partying, paying. I was paying all the bills, paying for everything. So he didn't have to pay for nothing. And then basically we were going around my mate's house one day and he's got a load of watches. So he said, Marv, you've got a load of watches here, do you want any? Because I had all the APs and all the, um, what are they called? All the watches anyway, we had all the watches. And I said, no, I'm all right, I'm sweet. And, and the kid, the, the driver, Mark Ashman said, can I have one? So I, I was like, my mate said, What's, I said, yeah, he's squeezing up. I've got to give him medis anyway, so I'll pay you no matter what. So he's like, all right, sweet, not a problem. So the very next week, I ended up taking 300 grand worth of cars off some people, right? And then basically I paid him wages out of that, assuming that he'd gone and paid the bill for the watch. But he never. Anyway, cut a very long story short, my mates rang me up one day. I ain't being funny, I hate to ask, Marv, but are you going to pay for that watch? What watch? He said, what's your pal took? I said, what pal? He said, your driver. I said, well, you ain't paid for that. That cheeky cunt. I said, see you, you miserable little cunt. I said, you need to take that fucking watch back, otherwise I'm going to come punch your head in, mate. Yeah? Take the watch back or pay for it, otherwise I'm going to punch your fucking head in, you little prick. What's it got to do with you? Mate's gone. What the fuck? Who are you talking to? What's it got to do with me, you cheeky cunt? My pal in my... You come to my pal's house, he give you a watch and you ain't paid for it. What are you, a cunt? I said, where are you? I said, I pulled the noose. I said, I'll be down in a minute. So I'll come out of the ass. I've got my little so-called nephew. Ash, hold that. I'll be back in a minute. I've given him my tool because I thought I'm going down the port. That makes sense taking out. I'll end up getting it. I'm going to punch his fucking head in anyway. So I've turned up. As I've turned up, Mark Carpell's sitting there. Right? And I'm going to talk about these people because I can. Right? So Mark Carpell's sitting there. I said, what the fuck? I said, where's your mate? He said, he's gone. I said, where? He said, be back in a minute. I said, is it like that? Yeah, sweet. He said, well, why don't you shoot off and I'll bring him up to the gym tomorrow? I said, no, as it happens, I'll wait here for him to come back, mate, because I ain't fucking shook or nothing. And whatever he's going to get, he can fucking use. And we'll see how fucking proper your power is. The little thing you don't know about your pal is I've been paying him for the last fucking seven months. Yeah, he's had over 100 grand off of me, the fucking squeak. Yeah, he ain't paid for fuck all. And he needs to pay for this watch. I'm going to smash his fucking head in. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, what do you mean, what am I talking about? Do you know what this is over? So he said, no. So I've explained to him what was over and he went at me, I do you know what, mate? Do yourself a favour, go home, and I'll bring him up to the gym tomorrow. I said, nah, bollocks. I don't give a fuck what he's going to get, mate. I'm going to wait here until he comes back and he can use what he's going to get. Simple. Obviously, I never believed he'd shoot me. I believed he'd have a knife, a bat. I didn't think he'd have a gun, right? So, we're sitting there talking. I've seen him walking, walking towards us. He was outside Solly's Diner in um, Port Venus. So, I've seen him, I've jumped up. I said, come on, cunt, let's walk up here, out of the way of all the public, right? So he's gone. So I said, what's that? I said, I've seen the gun. I said, yeah. I said, well, do what you come and fucking do, you mug. What? Because in my head, I'm thinking, right, just get close enough to grab it and you've done him. Do you know what I mean? I never believed he'd shoot me. And he shot me in the leg. 
straight away I've hit the deck because he just shattered into when I show you the x-rays he just shattered in 200 pieces just gone bang so I've hit the deck straight away and I thought you cheeky cunt I said you better get on with your job mate get on with your job and then he's walked over and he's gone bang next one's hit me in the arm I've hit the deck and he's gone bang he's gone down my willy shot my right testicle quiet and I thought well this cunt's going to kill me don't say another word don't say another word and then he's walked towards me and just walked over put the one down went one man in my forehead there and then I've gone to the floor, I thought he's kind of trying to kill me. And as I've opened my eye, he went bang. And the last one, look. Fucking hell, man. Yeah. Come straight out, went wow. straight in there, boy. And that's what, what? A, lot of people, a lot of people don't realise that's not real. Fucking Do you know what I mean? hell. Yeah. So he shot me straight in the eyeball. Mm -hmm. And when you see the x-rays, you'll see the x-rays. Because they don't know what prevented that from going into my brain. Because it just, when you see the x-rays in a minute, you'll see... What will I do with that? So even though the bullets shattered your knee, shattered your arm, that one didn't go right through and fucking... No, I never done nothing. And I never... My femoral archery got punctured in three places. Right? Punctured in three places. And I'll show you the scars. You can see it all because I've got mm -hmm. the, the photos and the x-rays. And I never bled. I never passed that. I rung my own ambulance. Do you understand? Like, and I was fully awake every step of the way. Like, it wasn't no... I never felt pain until they tried to move me. And when they try to move me, that's when it really hurt. And this was in the middle of Port Abanus? Port Abanus, yeah. Outside Court and Glaze, outside Solly's diner, you know. But I really did think he was going to kill me. And you know, I just, I just thought, this cunt, he can't kill me, this fat fucking puff. Because in my head, he had, a, he had his, his nipple pierced, he had his belly bump pierced, he had his tongue pierced. And that's what the, I mean, you fat fucking puff can't fucking kill me my daughter's only two weeks old my missus was in court in glaze getting a new buggy because the baby was too small for the buggy we got so we had to get a smaller buggy for the daughter. so she's in there getting a the buggy I'm outside lying on the floor so I'm trying to ring her to let her know I've been shot and then it just went pear shaped after that because in Spain when shootings happen you don't get treated as a victim you get treated as a perpetrator mm -hmm. so not only did I get nicked and arrested, my whole family and all my friends, my kids, everybody got nicked. My, my cousins, the house got raided, everyone got nicked, you know what I'm saying? So I'm there thinking, what the fuck? And then I've sort of gone to the hospital and then they're saying, are you okay, are you okay? And I just said, please, please, just save my leg. I don't care how much it costs, just save my leg. Because when I'm looking at my leg, it just looked fucked. Because where, I've, where, where he shot me and the, and the bone shattered, I've collapsed. So the leg just... All the pressure went on top of it. You, when you see the break, you'll understand what I'm talking yeah. about. So it was just like, it was, mad, it was in a mad shape on the floor. Mm -hmm. So all I said to him when I got me to the hospital, please just save my leg. So basically I went through about eight hours worth of surgery. Um, and then they done all they could do. Um, and I woke up in the morning and they said, you're going to be all right, it's going to be sweet and that. And then basically after speaking to all the specialists, um, and the budget and things like that. They said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I said, what are the alternatives? They said, you're never ever going to walk on this leg ever again, Mr. Herbert. Now there's a couple of things we can do. We can put something in there to strengthen the bone and give you a little bit more support, but there's too much fracture and you're never going to walk again. I hadn't seen the fracture all the x-rays up until this point. So I'm not getting it. I'm, I can wiggle my toes. I'm getting told, don't worry, you're going to be walking in two and a half years. The same voice that told me I was going to do no more than five years, told me I'm going to be walking two and a half years. So, sweet, I'm in the hospital. Um, three weeks later, I haven't been a shit. So I said to the nurse, 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 come here. So I said, I've got a problem. She went, what? I said, I ain't been a shit. El no caca, I had to speak Spanish to her, but I said, look, I ain't been a shit for three weeks. She was like, oh, don't worry about it, it's normal. I was like, right, when you get shot, it's normal not to shit. She said, no, don't be stupid, it's the morphine. Wow. I said, how long am I going to be on morphine for? Un año, dos año, one or two years. I was like, what? I'm going to be a fucking smackhead. That can't happen. Do you have a close to my bag or anything? No, 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 no. 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 Um, I said, I'm going to be a smackhead. I can't take this. And then basically, that night, before I went to sleep, my spirit come to me again and said, look, I'll make a deal with you. If you stop taking morphine, yeah, and people might think I'm mad when I say this sort of stuff, but it happened. He said to me, look, if you stop taking morphine, yeah, and you go through every bit of pain you're supposed to go through, I promise you I'll have you walking in two and a half years. But you've got to go through this for two and a half years. 
And I was like, sweet, I'll do that. He said, all right, you'll be walking. So then basically that happened. Um, I got, they, they, they come down and said, we're, we're going to put a plate in there. Put a plate in there, it'll cost 70 grand. Um, the plate is, I don't know, it's from my hip to my knee, you'll see the x-rays. Mm -hmm. like 16 pins in it from my hip to my knee. They took my two bottom ribs off this side and 17 centimetres of my pelvis and put that in. So here I've got no ribs and all my pelvis has gone there. So my love handle's gone from there. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They, they take that part of my pelvis, put yeah. that in. Um, and then basically, after that point, uh, I had to research all the nutrients that I need to walk again. Mm -hmm. So then I started finding out about my diet finding out about calcium. Where do I get calcium from? Now I found out nothing gives you calcium. So this is, this is... Except your own bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that gives you more calcium is broken bone. Yeah. So what did I do? Broke my bones, mate, for 18 months, just for continuously every four to six weeks, breaking my legs, breaking my legs, breaking my legs, breaking my legs. And then after six months... What do you mean breaking your legs, breaking your legs? Sam! Sam, go on. So you used to break your own fucking legs? I had legs. to, I had to, because right, that's when I found out you don't get no goodness. I got on the alkaline mm. diet, I stopped eating red meat, dairy, sugar, mm -hmm. only drunk green tea and lemons. Do you know what I mean? So I like to believe that everywhere I went in Spain, no one sold green tea. No one sold green tea. Now, everyone used to laugh at me, green tea, green tea, green tea, green tea. Mm -hmm. Now, green tea's rife everywhere. But I'd, green tea takes infections out of your blood, right? So that's why I started drinking green tea. And then I found out that alkaline creates uh, enzyme in your body which kills cancer-building properties. So anything that kills cancer is going to be good for my system. So I thought, right, eat everything alkaline. Stay away from dairy. Stay away from meat. Stay away from sugar. So I started drinking agave syrup. I use agave syrup, mm -hmm. beetroot, celery, cucumber, let, um, spinach. So you went plant-based as well? Well, I'm plant-based. Yeah. I've been here ever since, mm -hmm. right? So breaking the leg, breaking my leg. And then basically I got in the swimming pools. The swimming pools outside my house. Um, I had a rubber ring, rubber arms. And then I'd walk in the swimming pool and let a little bit of air out every day. After seven, eight months, I could walk a little bit on crutches. And then I started getting down the boxing gym. Do you know what I mean? With all the youngsters and then the olders and then the older lot and then the pro boxers. And then like, I was chief sparring partner. And I'm proud to say to young Joe Selkirk, which mm. was the most talented boxer that never made it out of Liverpool and he was phenomenal absolutely awesome and you were sparring with him even though with the fractured knee the one mate, eye mate, mate, no mate. fucking hip yep him I sparred Stevens um, Callum Smith Liam yeah, Smith he's a great fighter Callum yeah I've sparred yeah. them all I've sparred mm -hmm. them all I've sparred them all mm -hmm. and had some fantastic spars with all of them to the point where Stephen Smith wrote a testimonial saying he's never seen anybody push his brothers as hard as I push them in the ring that's what Stephen said in the testimonial to me. And considering that I've got one eye and half a leg. <laughs> this is I mean? true, man, yeah. Uh, what happened to the guy who shot you? He handed himself in. To get a sentence? He handed himself in with a prepared statement, said I was a hit man from London. And basically, he, I turned up to shoot him and he took the gun off me and shot me five times accidentally. He got sentenced in Spain and then got repatriated and then finished his bird off here. But I've... See that? Can I ask you something? See all the damage you've done? Do you feel as if that's a piece of karma as well? It's retribution. Do you think so? Yeah, trial and retribution for everything mm -hmm. I've ever been Watch this, right? And this is how simple it is. I got shot in exactly the same place I've been under investigation for other shootings. My eldest son has a birthmark everywhere I've been shot. No way. Yeah, Dane. He's got a birthmark everywhere I've got. And he brought that up to me. He said, Dad, you know what? I've just realised. I said, what? He said, I've got a birthmark everywhere you got shot, you know. I said, mm. shut up. He said, I have. And he's got a birthmark on his willy, on his leg, on his eye, on his arm. Do you know what I mean? Isn't life a powerful thing? And that's the power of your mind as well, the brain. When you focus yourself on something, no matter if it was doing a bank job, selling gear, getting money back, or changing your life for your knee, your eye, whatever, you've fought through it and it's capable of change, yeah. which we'll touch on in a bit. But you're also made world news, world headlines for the... Dale Cregan thing. Yeah. They bought the cop killer who killed the two coppers. You were yeah. apparently harbouring them, keeping well, them away and making, giving them money. And Yeah, but that was another manipulation by the 
the police, you know. Basically, what happened, um, Dale Cregan was associated, um, and the, this is what I like about police intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Because, oh, here it is. So the police intelligence suggests that Dale Cregan, Lee Kelly, and Jermaine Ward each had connections with Dave Campbell. Right now, why that is in there was because Dave Campbell pulled my pants down for 1.6 million quid. He pulled my pants down like I've done so much work with him and I give him all my money to look after. And then one day I wanted him asked for a lot of money. He said, "You ain't got no money with me." I was like, "What about this? What about that? What about this?" And he was like, "No." And then other people that were close to him, I rang him up. I said, "Remember that day I got that money? Who's with that money?" He said, "Yours." I said, "Well, your partner's trying to tell me now that it's his." It was like, no, it ain't. So basically, me and Dave had a problem. We had a falling out. Dave had his legs broken and got absolutely obliterated and then got pressured into pulling up my money. Um, he put a contract out on me and it says here, the police have been able to confirm that Osman warnings, threats to life, were given to Marvin Herbert on the 6th of the 10th, 2010. The 8th of the 10th, 2010. The 24th of the 12th, 2010. The 18th of the 7th, Second, 2011, the 12th of the 4th, 2011, the 4th of the 1st, 2012, and the 30th of the 1st, 2012. So these was all information that the police have got that my life was going to be in danger or people planning to kill me. So this Dave Campbell <clears throat> tried to pay Lee Kelly £150,000 to kill me over this problem that we had over this money. Um, and basically, what the case with Dale Cregan was, basically... Dale Cregan sent Jermaine Ward to visit or to contact me. Now, Jermaine Ward was someone that used to hang about with Lee Kelly. Um, and Lee Kelly, me and Lee used to do a lot of business with Dave Campbell before me and Dave fell out. And basically, I took m my cousin to do something with me in Manchester one day. And he took Jermaine to my family's house in Liverpool. Right? So basically, one day, I'm sitting in my cousin's house in Liverpool... And one of the boys has rung my cousin up and said, there's a geezer at my door looking for Marvin. It's unheard of. Liverpool's my safe haven. That's where my family are. No one knows where my people are in Liverpool that we have ag with. So I've gone to my cousin, this is a problem. That's got to be Dave and them lot. They've found out where I am. I've got to go and iron him out. Right? So I've turned up to iron out whoever's at this door thinking they're there to kill me. Right? Jermaine's there. Jermaine, I said, what the fuck? He's like, oh, Marv, Dale needs to speak to you. I said, where is he? He said, he's out of the way at the minute. He needs to speak to you. We've had a bit of a problem. I said, about what? He said, oh, but so a couple of people have been shot. This is happening, that's happening. He needs to speak to you. I was like, mate, you know what? Um, I ain't really got time to see him, you know, because to me, he's connected to Lee and to Dave and to the, my money. So he might be trying to lure me somewhere to get me ironed out so the money ain't paid, right? So I said, look, the young kid that looked after me when I got shot, Sam Wilby, yeah, he got nicked with me as well on this. Um, he'd invited me to, his brother was leaving this country. He'd been, he'd joined the services, the army, and he was leaving this country going on tour. So they was doing a leaving party for him in Hearn Bay. So I got invited to this Hearn Bay reunion on the 18th of the month. I can't remember which month specifically it was. So what I said to Jermaine was, if he wants to see me, yeah, tell him to come to Herne Bay on this date and meet me here at this time and I'll see him, not a problem. Not thinking he'd turn up. I didn't think he'd turn up. So, boom, I've turned up to Herne Bay doing what I'm doing, walked out onto the road and I've seen Jermaine and Dale. I said, oh, what's happening? What's happening? He's like, oh, yeah, sweet, 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 sweet. I said, what, what the fuck do you want to see me for? He said, Marv, listen, I need help. I said, doing what? He said, I need to get out of the country. I said, I'm not really in all that stuff no more, you know. He was like, what do you mean? I said, well, me and Dave don't really have anything to do with each other no more. Why don't you go and speak to Dave? He said, nah, what it is, I've hand grenaded someone. I was like, what the fuck? I said, why are you coming to see me for? I said, you know, that's terrorism, isn't it? He was like, what are you on about? I said, bruv, we can't get nicked. We can't even get seen together. Come. So I've took them to my mate's house where I had a key for. And I've gone in. I said, mate, you can't, you, you better go and hand yourself in. I said, you're fucked. Well, you threw a hand grenade on someone. He said, yeah. I said, mate, you're fucked. You're fucked. Trust me. I said, you're never coming out. You do know that, don't you? He was like, what, what, what? I said, mate, I can't get involved in this. I've got other things going on. I can't get involved. Cut a long story short. 
Um, he's with Jermaine. I like Jermaine because Jermaine was Lee's friend. So what I sort of said to them, like, look, Jermaine, let Jermaine go. Let him hand himself in. So I've said to Jermaine, go and hand yourself in and tell the police that these lot threatened you and you had to do what they told you. They put a gun to you. They were going to threaten you. They threatened your family. Just go and hand yourself in. But Jermaine couldn't do that. So he went and handed himself in. He handed himself in, but he wouldn't tell the police that they threatened him. So he got 35 years recommended, the fucking idiot. Do you know what I mean? And they bullied him into driving. Like, do you know what I mean? Anyway, um, and then basically he went off and shot the two police officers. And then what he'd done, when he went off and left me, I left and took Jermaine and then put, I'll give Jermaine the money to get in on a train and go and hand himself in. He went and hand himself in. Now, that one them lot left. Now, what happened later, and this is what the police intelligence, the police intelligence um, confirmed, Dal Cregan, look, a man called Tony Barnett, who owns a business in Hearn Bay, is in debt to many different people. It's widely known that some of those people are from up north. One of those males who did the shooting and the name Cregan had been mentioned. Cregan is owed money by Tony Barrett, who lived in Hearn Bay. So that was why he was in Hearn Bay. He wasn't in Hearn Bay to see me. So what he'd done, he'd turned up to see this fella and remembered where my mate lived and he'd knocked on the door to see if he could get hold of me. But he nicked my mate's dad's phone, right? He's nicked my mate's dad's phone, right? My mate's dad didn't even realise, right? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? I thought he lost it. Dal Cregan, yeah, only went and handed himself in the fucking police station with that phone. Right? So I believe he handed himself in the police station with that phone because I never helped him get out of the country. Do you know what I mean? And that phone connected to my mate's dad. My mate's dad got nicked, never broken the law at all in his life, never been nicked with a parking ticket. He got nicked, his son got nicked, another straight goer, never been nicked before. Fucking spud here. Yeah, for four murders. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then they're banged up in strange ways. I'm in Spain. I've heard about him getting nicked. I was like, what the fuck? Next thing you know, boom, my door's come through in Spain. I'm nicked. I'm coming out of the gym, they nicked me. Four murders. Do you know what I mean? I was like, what the fuck? And then we all come, and then all the intelligence set me free you know because again um, Peter Fury and Aaron Coglan was sitting down as a mediator for Dave Campbell on the meeting and the, the intelligence suggests that um, we come to a formal agreement because basically what happened, on the meeting I said look if you don't want to pay me the 1.6 million quid, I'll take, because he's trying to say, I don't owe you this, I don't owe you that, this happened, that. So there's a load of bollocks, a load of lies. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do then, right? Just to keep it simple, I'll take 10%. Right? So I said, Peter, I'll accept 10%. Right? So I don't want 1.5 million quid, I'll accept 150 grand. How about that? And I'll walk away. Right? And everyone was happy. So we all shook hands and we left. Right? And that was how that meeting got left. The police that laid me down when I went on that meeting followed me all the way home, followed Peter Fury all the way home, followed Aaron Coglin all the way home, right? And then that intelligence came out in my trial. So what we're saying is that um, Dave, who was wired up talking about all this stuff, is trying to get me to implicate myself in other crimes and stuff like that. And the intelligence that come out in the Cregan case was that me and Dave... It says that me and Dave Campbell was former criminal associate. Right, so this was, police intelligence confirms that Marvin Herbert and David Campbell are former criminal associates and they was involved in a dispute in the later part of 2011 which resulted in financial debt. The police intelligence suggests both men bore each other ill will. Right, so when all that happened, I've demanded all this to be released in court on my trial because they're trying to say that Dale Cregan, who's Dave Campbell's youngster, was using me as an exit to the country. And I'm saying it don't make sense at that time. Right, MGM had started, so I was an integral part to MGM. Right, I've done everything. Oh, do you know what? I've got it over there as well. I've got, I've got the, the legal documents I've got from Colt. Yeah, you can send us that and we'll throw it up on the screen yeah. anyway when you're talking about right, it. So it will come out that I'm an integral part of MGM. Um, I've started rehabilitating the kids now. Remember I said I got nicked for the firearm? Because when, when Dave Campbell's legs got broken, when Dave's legs got broken, I, my ass got raided, right? Yeah, because you're accused of it. You'd done that, broke yeah, his yeah. legs. Right, so 
I got nicked, and when they searched my ass, they found um, a Glock. They found a Glock, um, all the sprays, um, coshes, like, no, every weapon you need yeah. in that world, like knuckle dusters, blades, yeah. all that. They found a bag of tools in the house. So, when I got nicked, I got nicked for the, 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 the firearm in the house. Um, what was the moral of that? Yeah, so I got nicked for the firearm. So I've been nicked. I got nicked, that's when I got nicked for the firearm. So over the Dave Campbell, they've come to my house and nicked me. And that's when it all went sort of Pete Tong for Dave, his life just sort of spiralled out of control. He's under police protection, you know. Mm. Um, every time I come to England, I was put under Robbo. Any time I went to Manchester, I got arrested. Do you know what I mean? Like I weren't allowed within a, I got told them if I get seen within 150 yards of his house, the police are going to take that as a direct threat and deal with it appropriately. But I'm the response sitting on his drive, so I knew what that meant. So I stayed away from him and stayed away from everyone in Manchester until I got nicked. And then when I got nicked, I had to prove that I would no part in that. So when I got nicked for the firearm, that was the, that was the point. I got nicked for the firearm over Dave Campbell. Now, the reason why I never went to prison in Spain is because the chief of the local police said that I do too much good work in the community by keeping the kids off the street and away from crime. So that's what I started doing after my shooting in Spain. And that's what I was the... I was like the starting of the foundation of MTK mm -hmm. sort of thing, like helping the young kids, the Spanish kids, yeah. learn boxing and English. Mm -hmm. Like all the kids had to bring their homework to the gym. I was at all the amateurs, right? So all the amateurs had to bring their homework to the gym. If they had school reports that were bad, they weren't allowed to the gym. Like, there was they had yeah. good days, bad days. Yeah. And, but you get away with all that anyway. Yeah, that, yeah. that, 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 that I got. See your life. It's um, why uh, I'm surprised how you're not dead or doing a lifer. This is un it's unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. But you say you hear a voice or a spirit. You're obviously here for a reason. And that's what I realised. You're here for a reason. And the beauty of life is you have totally transformed your life. Even though this story you're telling me now is, is a roller coaster, people are going to be thinking, what the fuck? What, I, the people can't believe it. And, I, and I've interviewed over 100 people now. I believe this story will be one of the most viewed and most watched because the power in the story, everything you've went through to now, here we are now, the changes you started to make. Why did you start making the changes to go, wait a minute, I don't need this fucking life anymore? Do you know, and this is the madness, right? This is the madness. Because of the, no love. I realised <laughs> yeah. no one loved me. I actually realised they weren't my friends. I'd done everything in my, like, and everybody that knows me knows me, right? So I do what I do because I love you, mm -hmm. right? I do what I do because I love my manner. Like someone said it to me, we went to a 50th party last week. So I had a party over um, Hampstead, Hampstead Heath. And um, Ivor, one of my young, one of my old friends, he said, no, nah, I remember you when we were kids, bruv. You used to look after everyone. Like no one, like I'd fight everybody's battles. And if you was out and you was from my manor, you were safe. Like I'd fight, stab, shoot, and do what everyone needed to do. And I was prepared to kill, but I never actually had to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, 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 I was, it was just everything. Do you know what I mean? Doing everything and everything and everything that everybody wanted to do. What every people thought about doing is what I used to do. Do you understand? And I'm thankful that. I never personally had to kill people. What was that moment for you then that you decided to fuck this enough's enough? I'm getting no love. People are using me. No, it was, it was, it was, I, was, I was in the hospital. No one come to see me. No one come to see me. And I thought, what are these fucking scumbags, man? How can they not even come? And then, when I'm ringing people, they're uh, uh, or not answering the phone and making excuses. That like, it's 70 pound a flight return. Like, how can you not come and see me? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, wow, the things, like, what I've done for these fucking people. What I've done for these people, like I fucking got stabbed up for you, I got fucking cut for you, I went to prison for you. Do you know what I mean? I had ag for two years for you. Like what the fuck? Like and it was never ending, never ending. The amount of debt I've got in for people, like everyone knows the drug game, right? So if I got someone bail for a bit of gear and they go out of spending all the money, they do the bollocks, right? In a couple of months' time, they owe forty, fifty grand. I've actually gone and fucking stole that to pay people's debts, and they couldn't come and fucking see me in hospital. Do you know what I mean? And I started thinking, what the fuck? And that's why I just thought, you know what, fuck England. I'm not, I'm not doing it no more. So then I made a real 
real relationships with people that actually open my eyes. You know, they open my eyes to reality of life. And I know one of my pals gets a lot of stick in the, in the Irish media at the moment, you know, but if it weren't for these people, like, I don't say it, Daniel Kinahan, right? Now, he gets a lot of bad press, but I couldn't be here today if it wasn't for Daniel. Like, and I couldn't be here to give you this interview. I couldn't be legitimate because these people, the principles and the morals they have, actually woke me up to reality. Do you understand? Like, and it's, it's something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, the life I've led. Do you understand? Like, because I've done it as an opportunity to change things and get out of something. I haven't done it because I, I wanted to. I've done it because I had to. I, I never felt I had many choices or many options growing up as a kid, right? So that's what I felt I had to do. And I fell victim to the normalization of the insanity. Like many of thousands, if not millions of people do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's fucking nuts to live that life. Like every day, day in, day out. So just reflecting on something that's coming to me, Ed, now. I've, I, I come here with my camera guy because I was being doing obviously I'm getting a lot of footage of everything I do right mm -hmm. so I've walked into my house one day and I got had a bit of mail right and it just made that like, I feel so you know when you look down and you see Marvin Herbert mm -hmm. yeah like I've never I was never allowed to be able to have a registered address a car registered to me mm -hmm. in fear of retaliation or in fear of something you know so having my own my own home address like bills to my daughter like bills in my name i've got a bank account like i actually feel normal you know yeah. like and it's <sighs> it's a shame that i wasted 40 years of my life to get to the position that i'm in today when i know if i'd have listened to the voices that i was hearing as a kid correctly growing up i would have been a billionaire already but i put my assumption and expectation on the voices that I heard. So it was telling me to do things and you're gonna, you're gonna be the biggest, you're gonna be the baddest, you're gonna be the richest, you're gonna be the... But I wasn't meant to be doing it in an leg illegitimate world. I was supposed to be in the legitimate world. I've come into the legitimate world in five years and I've made such an impact already. Do you understand? So yeah. I know where I was supposed to be mm -hmm. and I know why I went through what I went through. And I know that because of my journey, it gives me the experience to sit in front of anybody. And that's the powerful thing. Yeah. Come on, man, you never made no money selling drugs. What money do you make? Mm -hmm. Right now, they'll all, they all talk about making money, but mate, you all juggle money, you all handle money. Like I was at the top of the tree, right? And they're spinning billions, right? They're spinning billions, but they're losing every month, every year, every week, every month, losing. Catch up, juggling from Peter to Ball. You know what I mean? They're living a good life, handling a lot of money. But the actual profit margins are very slim, right? But the lifestyle is great. Do you understand? Because you subsidize the lifestyle by creating more debt. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then you shuffle the debt with products and people. That's yeah. all I've noticed. So the penultimate turning point for me in that world, after getting shot, I was still in it. So I was doing a few bits and pieces. I'm doing a little bit of weed here and there. Um, yeah, not just a little bit, but doing enough to, to sustain a lifestyle to live in Marbella and live around, do I'm traveling business class and whatever I wanted to do. So there was a few kids and we had these encrypted devices. They're all fucked. They're <laughs> fun. Right, so we had these encrypted devices. So you send a product to someone mm -hmm. and then they send you your cash. So you we got the delivery. It's all done in a certain way. Crash band model, crash band model. So this one kid, I've given him a bit of graft and I've got, him, I've got a few kids grafting, but I'm giving them the graft, the money at graft prices, not at a street price. So people paying 19,000 pounds for something, I could get it for 11. Do you understand? So there's no way you're gonna get in debt. So these youngsters now, they're falling behind. Falling behind, I'm thinking, who the fuck is this little cunt? These fucking little shitheads, man. How are they always behind? They're taking the piss out of me. Yeah, they're taking the piss out of me. They've got to be. Fuck it. Light this little cunt up. All right, sweet. Make sure you find out who it is because obviously I know a lot of older people so I don't want to do someone and find out it's my pal's nephew or my pal's cousin or something. So I always find out who the person is who's going to get hurt. Fucking found out it's my son's mate. <laughs> and that was it. That was, that was the penultimate turning point in my life. So I just sort of thought, mm -hmm. I went to him, I called him, I said, look, I need to see you. 
So I said, listen, youngster. I said, you know, that's me. You owe this dough to. And he's like, what? I said, bruv, I'm going to give you an option and you can either take it or not. I said, you can owe the money and pay it off, but you're not going to be paying me. I'm going to sell you that to someone else because today I'm coming off the road. Right? But what I will do for you, if you come off the road with me today, I'll wipe your debt. Right? So what do you want to do? Do I pass your debt on or do you want to come off the road? He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, mate. I said, but let's just get in the gym for the next six months and we'll see what happens. And he said, all right, sweet. Because in his head, he's thinking, I don't have to pay that money. I'll just say, yeah, yeah sweet, yeah, 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 sweet. And then fuck him off down the lane. Yeah. So boom, he started coming to the gym every day with me. He was mm -hmm. a little fat cunt coming <laughs> to the gym. Right? After six months, he's ripped up. Mm -hmm. He's ripped and he's gone into this business, done this business, done this. Now he sort of manages, I think, the most up and coming artist this country's got and he's got three or four coming up behind him and they're turning over three, four hundred grand a year. So he's doing right. well. So he changed his life. He's changed his life around as well. And I, you changed his life. He well, done it himself. Like I said you to him, him I, the path. I, 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 I took him to the water mm -hmm. and I'll give him the incentive yeah. not to continue on the road that he was on. Because how I looked at it when I sort of got to the point in my life where I wanted to change, right? I actually got to the top of the ladder. Right. I got to the top of the ladder where a lot of people in England don't get to. Right. So I was involved in the far gaff, right? And a lot of people don't realise how that works. So being involved at the level where it comes from the far gaff, it gets sold in Africa, it gets sold in Europe, you've got all your profit. You don't need to send it back here. Do you understand? So I'm earning money. And then I'm watching all these people here getting nicked, getting shot, getting killed. Why? Why? Because of me, how long is this going to last for? It's got to be forever. Do I really want to cause this pain and suffering forever? Do I really want to be involved in this? When I used to mug off drug dealers, like I wouldn't pay for drugs up until I was 24. I would refuse to pay for drugs. So I used to take drugs off people and just say, what? I ain't paying you, what? What? And that was how I used to do it. And I used to knock people out. I used to take, got people, got your gear on you, yeah. I used to pull out a wad of 50 so they lighten up. I say, how many gear? You know, I give it seven of them. And they give me the seven, I'll just knock them out, I'll just walk off or pull a tool out. I say, I ain't paying you. What do you think? I'm paying for drugs, you little mug. Piss off. So I was a horrible bastard of a man growing up as a young individual in that world. And the slap in my face was that I'm going to be the cause of all the devastation for the next few years if I continue doing this. And I just weren't, I weren't, Ready to do that anymore? Is it, I'm trying to look for the right, right word, but it's just like I weren't prepared. But it's not. It's bigger than prepared. It's just I didn't want to be responsible for the death, murder, and suffering that I was going to be causing by transporting and helping transport the products. Mm -hmm. And being a cause of a problem is something that I don't want to be. I want to be a solution. So my mindset switched to a solution. How do I do that then? How the fuck do I do this? So then, who do I know who's done this? One of my pals. He was another guy, the most egotistical kid. I've got the photos of him in here as well. Most egotistical kid growing up. He got nicked for armed robberies, loads of armed robberies, like, and I'm doing 25 years and got out. Now he's turned his life around. He's a legitimate quantum surveyor now, but he's, he deals with 100, 200, 300 million pound contracts all over England and that, right? So he had something called the Nor Initiative which done intervention, motivation, speaking, and all that sort of stuff. But he was the most egotistical. He had to have the fastest car, the biggest watch. When we were growing up as kids, right? Like, we, none of us had lots of money, but we all had the materialistic acquisitions, right? So he transcended, transcended into this world at the same level. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So then it was either, when I got off of the Dal Cregan case, it was either go back to Spain and pick up where I left off, right? Or make a step. So I took the, the step of faith, the leap of faith. How was it for you coming out of that life after being in it for 40 years? Do you know what? I'm a great believer in the spirit world, right? So it was something that I wasn't frightened of because I know I'm always going to be okay. I don't know how I know, but I know... Feel I'm protected. Yeah. I've got an invincible spirit. I've been told that by my spirit guide. I've got... I'll send you a reading that I've had done me, yeah. so you can hear. I believe in all that. No, 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 mate, I'm so... In tune. Yeah, it's unreal. And 
I know it and I've known it for years, but now I'm in the right place with the right products, with the right energy, we're going to get the right results. And I do believe that I'm put on this earth to make change. So what change am I going to make? I'm going to change the mindsets of the youngsters, not to be drug dealers, grafters and gangsters. I'm going to create billionaires. Do you understand? Because that's what we've all got inside of us. And if I'd have gotten the journey now, because I have it with people that are worth hundreds of millions now. Do you understand? Like, I've just done something for someone that's one of the most wealthiest people I know. And I had to live in his house. Do you know what I mean? To help him overcome certain things and get through certain things and deal with certain things. I'll get his mind in the right place, put him on a training program, eating, diet, and doing things correctly now. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. we've, got, we've got so much to offer everyone and so much to give because of what we've been through. So now I understand the wealth in my journey and I have to make it a value to everybody. So I yeah. do that by giving, you know. So your value will be your inner strength. Now you can take your eye, take your hip, your knee, but your soul will never be broken. It's too pure. Listen, f fucking crazy, yes. Been through a lot of shit, yes. Understandable, of course, because you went what you went through as a kid. Yeah. But everything you've went through, sometimes you're the chosen one. Chosen people to go through all the misery, the pain, the heartache, see the suffering, the shit that you went through yourself. You've got to feel it also. As much as you can give it out, you must feel the pain. And you've came to such a certain point where, fuck it, enough is enough where you can make your changes. So when you speak now, people will listen. Why? Because you've been through the life of misery. You've been to hell not just once, but many fucking Up occasions. Do you know what sure. I mean? So you must be proud of yourself for what you've come. Even when you talk, you can feel your, your, you have your heart in your sleeve. Even the emotion, speaking about your mum, your dad. You love your dad. You clearly loved your mum. You try to protect your mum, but you still wanted to show respect for your dad, but it's still hard because you've still got all that trauma and pain for such a young age. So it's understandable what the fuck you've went through. Mm. But for what you've done, man, and what you're doing now to helping kids, to speaking at schools, to planning for the future, it's a beautiful thing, man. Do you know what? I've got, I've got to say this now, right? Nah. I'm going to show you now. Because mm -hmm. this is amazing, right? Right, this is amazing. So... One sec. This is a response. We just we just lost the bid, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a response. Hi Marvin, hope you are well. Unfortunately, we came second in the HMP bid to G4S, right? So we come second to mm -hmm. G4S, right? Um, in the program, they scored marginally higher on a couple of questions than Circo, so it was very tight in something we scored much higher in the G4S, the rehabilitation and the resettlement work, we, we, we made, we, we beat everybody with the rehabilitation and resettlement programs that we're gonna mm -hmm. be going in because that was, I was gonna be, have a department in a prison. I was gonna get my own keys and everything for That's a prison. That's unbelievable. Sick. And yeah. we, just, we only come second to G4S for doing mm -hmm. that. And that was with me and Andy Pritchard done that from um, the AP Foundation, because I worked with Andrew um, and he was like, the driving force. When I was saying earlier mm -hmm. that I used to get paid for my car bits from the Coke and all yeah. them sort of things. Well, that was the the channel because he was the older lot to us younger lot and everything they was involved in, like we, just, we all become part of the same energy stream. So mm -hmm. indirectly, me and Andrew have been connected for 30 odd years, yeah. and but directly, physically for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that's because I believe we've both changed our lives in ways this a synchronicity yeah people, it's never, come, people come out and in your life all the time but there's always a connection there with some people you know 20 30 years ago how that's a, life is fucking a, a weird thing how people come back in again whether he's on a wrong path at yeah. a the time then you come on a good path and right. you just connect the, again remember the guy i said earlier about um mango when yeah. i had the fight really. yeah well that same geezer after i come back from um ibiza i tried to contact him for years and I could never contact him. Do you know what I mean? I could yeah. never get hold of him. And now I actually look back retrospectively and I remember now, basically I never met him or Andrew back in the day because if I did, then it would have been a lot more chaoticness, a lot more madness. Mm -hmm. And because the energy had a plan for us all, it put us all back together because even young Mango, we come back together last year and he's doing exactly what I'm doing now in Birmingham. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? You know? You've put a lot of people through heartache and misery yourself, but we spoke earlier and you've actually met a couple of victims to apologise and just give you, to say sorry that you weren't that person. How was that feeling? Um, well, there's been a couple of occasions. Basically, I've been... 
a little bit of the ag. I've had people contact me, the victims people, and contact me and said, look, we understand it weren't personal. We don't want any problems with you. As far as you're concerned and we're concerned, is it done and dusted? I've said, yeah, if you want to make it personal, get a bit of retribution, then you can do what you like without consequence. Like I've actually gone back to people that I've hurt, people that I've stabbed, people that have been shot, and actually said to them, look, you can do me back. I never meant to do it, I just lost it. You know, because I was nuts. I'm not embarrassed to say that I was absolutely nuts. Like, I'm not proud of the person I was. I'm proud of what I've come through, but I'm not proud of the person I was because I hurt a lot of people for for nothing really, you know, like for ego, for reputation, f like for nothing. Yeah. Right? And some people I possibly could have ruined their lives, you know, the damage I've caused people. Like there's a few people that I reflect back on, I thought, I wonder where happened to that geezer. I wonder where happened to that geezer. I wonder where happened to that geezer, you know, because people just mind their own business and they've just stood on my shoe or bumped me the wrong way. And I've absolutely obliterated them, stabbed yeah. them till they stopped moving. Like I say I've never killed anybody, but I've never consciously killed anybody. So I thought, oh, he's dead, I've done that. Do you understand? But people might have died from their... At, um, yeah, injuries. Wounds. I don't know. I don't trauma know. as well, pain, yeah. suicide. Do you know what I mean? There's so many different factors, but the fact is that is the past. Yeah, you're here now. So going forward for the future, the things that you're trying to do, what is it you're you've got oh, planned? Uh, we've got everything planned. Basically, I'm looking to get um, a, a, my own training facilities. So the MarvinHerbert.com is my web page. Um, the Marvin Herbert Limited is the new um, company. Um, it was Dispute Resolutions before and GMAC Global. So now basically what I'm doing, I'm drawing up programs. So all the young kids now that are getting groomed and ready for the road, I'm going to try to get into their minds and show them that you can be a billionaire by through the courses and the workshops that we deliver. I believe I'll make them believe me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And like, it don't matter who you are. If you know how to invest, yeah, and you know how to work hard, you're going to be successful in the legitimate world. It's not complicated, but you've got to have the right team, the right plan, and the right strategy. And this is success. Like, I know some people now, and they're not the brightest tool in the box, but they're worth hundreds of millions. Do you understand? Like, and these are people that I refused to even socialise with when I was a kid growing up. Because to me, they was all fucking idiots. I can't speak to them. They're yeah, it's all fairies. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they're worth, they've got helicopters, yeah. they've got jets, they've got mm -hmm. big mansions, they've got chateaus. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So I actually see the difference. Like I became, uh, it nearly come to me then. Um, there's a word for it. Fuck. <laughs> it's not that really evil yeah. pop into your head. Yeah, it was, yeah. um, so basically, oh, right, so I'm a, I became a successful criminal, but I amounted to nothing, right? So I never actually became anything but a successful criminal. Do you understand? So all that energy, if I'd have put that into becoming an architect, uh, a quantum surveyor, an electrician, I would have been able to build, grow, invest, build, grow, invest, build, grow, invest, and then sell bits and pieces. Listen, mate, for coming on today and telling your story, it's phenomenal for everything you've went through. First of all, you should be proud. You're doing amazing things, man, and I can't wait to see what you do in the future, man. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's grown, thing. It's yeah. grown, it's grown now. Would you like to finish up on anything? Um, I, I, I've paid the price physically, materialistically, and financially for the crimes I've committed. I've been penalized through penitentiary and incarceration. Physically, I've been stabbed 20 times. I've been cut 14 times. I've been shot five times. I've been hit with axes, chopped in the head with axes, all sorts, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. all these things have happened because of the life that I've led. And I've been incarcerated, I've been beaten, I've been tortured, I've been shot. But that was my consequence to my actions. So yeah. I've, the trial and retribution of my life has been lived and accepted and I've become accountable for what I've done. And now it's about 
engaging with the youngsters and letting them know that it ain't worth it. It's really not worth it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be that multi-millionaire. You're not going to be able to retire wealthy. It can't happen. It's not set up for that. It's a lifetime of ag, deprivation, prison and death. And that is all it is. And if you want a life of that, then sign up. If you don't, then don't bother because it's there, it's happening. You're going to prison. You're getting shot. You're possibly getting sh um, stabbed. Like all these things are going to happen. Stabbing, shootings, cutting, prisons, robberies. Like it's going to happen to you. Like unless you're the robber, stabber, shooter yourself. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Yeah. You've either got to be the yin or the yang. But either way, it's all bad or bad. So why be in here at all when Lee, every major villain, every major villain that's turned the age of 40, 50 years of age tells you, fuck, I wish I'd have done something different. <laughs> right? Yeah. I wish I'd have took a look. There's some people that are actually caught up in it still that are loving it. And I actually feel really sorry for them, you know, because it's no fun. I wouldn't wish my life on my worst enemy. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it, mate. You know? Yeah. Marv, for coming on today, big man, Come and on. telling your story, it's been an absolute pleasure, my honestly. Pleasure, it's my phenomenal. Pleasure, my pleasure. I wish you all the best for the future. Keep hustling, big man. Yeah, and come on. God bless. That's it. We're on it, man. We're on it.